Recording is on. Okay, we're on. So do you want to introduce it here? Oh, good morning, everybody. It's the Eastern meeting, the Extinction RT meeting, which is must be about 93 now, I think we're getting into. It's Sunday, January the 9th. And yeah, let's begin. So on the agenda today is to talk about some topics that Gary raised. Um, one of the first ones is why we piss everybody off. Uh, it's mainly me that pisses everybody off. <laughs> yeah, we have a, a long hit record. And so the first point of discussion is Paul Kingsnorth, who who just uh, waved us off. Um, yeah, so, yeah, what should, what should we say? We, so, so a batting record is not good. It's like with Alison batted us off. Uh, um, Darren uh, did a bit. Um, uh, uh, Guy McPherson did. Uh, the, the reason for the Guy McPherson one was because I refused to remove negative comments on the interview with him. So he said, uh, did a long email exchange, about 50 emails, and then said, it, it, you know, threatened legal action. <laughs> legal action because I didn't remove the comments. <laughs> and they weren't that bad. There was nothing really bad. It's really just it's just very strange. So anyway, that was that was him a while back. Um, but anyway, that's that's the way it goes. Yeah, what do what do people think? I mean, we're dealing with egos. The, everybody's got an ego, and they they it takes a bit of ego <coughs> to start making videos. I'm talking from experience. It's a lot of hard work. <laughs> I don't think people realize it unless you actually made videos and stuck them out there and done all this. You don't realize how much hard work actually it is. So you have to be motivated by something, and most people are motivated by ego. Can I say something about about this? Um, because I think what I noticed is that the exchanges I had with Paul by email for the last year or two were always very cordial until he turned um, more mediatic about his uh, his faith, and um, I think from then on he started to. To become much more defensive, I watched quite a few of his um, of his interviews, and uh, not only the one that we posted on the sub. And he seems to be selecting who he's talking to. He seemed to be promoting a lot of his new stuff. And I, I yes, you are right about the ego. I think also, um, I think he only wants to talk to people who 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 kind of comfort him and make him feel good about what he's doing. So. I was quite surprised mm. that he wouldn't want to engage with us. Now, I never came forward with any of our manifestos and company and things like that. I, I just, uh, you know, I, I contacted him as a writer and as a guy I, I respected. Um, you know, he's a very good writer. So I think that he must have been looking at our videos or reading our sub because there was no other places <laughs> where we talked about him re in recent time about his Christianity. So I think he has actually... Whatever it doesn't matter if he doesn't want to interact with us, he's he's looked at our stuff, and it seemed like it was like sulfur for him. Um, he was not happy that I didn't for the people who didn't read the emails there, but he was not happy that I didn't engage with him, saying that we were and uh, that we didn't agree with him. That's basically that. So I think that was this big thing because otherwise I'd say he wouldn't have had a problem because up until yesterday he was ready to, to talk to us and i think he must have done a bit of research on us looked at who we were and i think it would have not been good online for him to talk to us and it was the same with alison because alison thought also that it was not good for her audience to see her in you know interacting with people like us so we have a bad reputation yeah <laughs> i think we should try keep it up um the I think he read comments that I did about him, and I think he got a bit triggered because in that email that he sent back to you, he 
he referred to a few things which I <laughs> said. And so I think he must have looked at the post. But I mean, from my point of view, I think that you know, I put those posts in there in public with the expectation that he sees them. <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't try hide them. I don't think that he wouldn't see them. Um yeah, it's yeah, yeah. On another po on another uh, um, posit, I got a contact uh, yesterday uh, from the delegate, the Irish delegate for Deep Green Resistance, and she is happy to talk to us on the week starting on the seventeenth of January. So I've yet to decide of a day and a and a time with her. So I will probably send an email around to see that the time and day is okay for everybody before I I, I confirm with her. And uh, I'd say that would be interesting. Um, so that's another, that's the that's the next interview. But I would be interested to hear what people have to say, and you in particular, Hugh, about um, what following the thoughts of Gary. But like, what are we looking for when we interview people? What is it? You know, what is behind all this? What? Why are we? Why are we getting such a reaction? And what should we should we pursue people who you know? What way should we do that? Discuss that. I'd, I'd like to discuss that. Yeah, um, there's a new guy on the block, uh, which Sandy Shellis and them, uh, new Duma on the block. <laughs> this, uh, Professor Elliot, uh, Elliot, I can't remember what his name is, but anyway, um, I posted the video up there, but maybe we should should get him. But yeah, um, yeah, what's the point of interviewing people? Well, um it's just a I think it's just for our own personal development but I think these days I'm thinking you know we should start uh, spreading the word about the the flippening and, and that kind of thing so maybe we should gear it towards that so you know so I, I would like to do things like scientific things that so people talk about the science of it you never get real I mean I never get anything anything much out of it um talking to these these you know talking head guys who who are well known they i mean i think they just they said sell, they're selling kind of sympathy and you know put a often a bit of opium and stuff like that so um it's it's you have you're supposed to do all these interviews and stuff just to keep up your viewership but you know, I mean, what, but unless it's really enlightening people, I think it goes round and round in circles. They always come to the same conclusions. It's like, you know, it's, when, when I hear all the stuff, it's like people post stuff and say, they all like, hey, look at this, you know. Uh, and I'm like saying, yeah, everybody's saying the same darn thing. It's just going nowhere. I mean, what's the point of this? So I, I think that the first, you know, new thing out there that anybody said on the subject is is what we're saying in the manifesto about the flipping but otherwise it's 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 all everybody's pregnant with this change you know everybody's you know like oh things are about to change we're at a crossroads and so, so like yeah everybody knows that <laughs> now what <laughs> no, no one gets gets beyond that in the conversation and we're trying to open up this new conversation but i don't know i get the impression that everybody's stuck going around in circles and we're the only ones got mo moving ahead i think maybe we should Hugh. just forge ahead and just see see who falls in line you know who, who. But, but i think we've got the same problem that we also discussed with with faulty and um just as an aside there i i think we have to award faulty the 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 full credit for being probably the only one that we ever spoke to who really obviously listened and let himself be challenged by that it really took took on what we said at, at, at depth you know you, I, I think he was the only one who really clearly displayed that he was doing that i don't think anybody else did um but what i want to say was just um you made the comment in the manifesto there towards the end about people not changing um and I, I replied to that, you know, specifically about uh, Paul Kingsnall, but it applies to a, a lot of people who have got a an established um, uh, uh, way of operating 
and, you know, certain people following them and or they've written books and they've got a, a, a reputation and, and all this kind of thing. They've got, they've got too much invested in a certain way. It certainly to let themselves be challenged and put in a, 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 a strange position in, in public. I mean, you might find if you could talk to Paul Kings North privately, just as one person to another, that, that the situation could be quite different. Um, but what I'm thinking is that, you know, maybe it's not, it's not a fruitful exercise to be pursuing people with some kind of a profile that you it, maybe it's a, a small pond that doesn't have much effect on the world but just talking to fairly unknown people because they're the ones who can quite they can let themselves be challenged where's the embarrassment nobody knows who the fuck they are you know they're, they're not trying to uphold anything they're, they're not having their career or their 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 uh their you know whatever it is they're the curriculum detail, whatever it is, challenged. You know, they 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 they're not. This it's not this structure to to defend. Um. So there's that, and uh, uh, I think there's two things regarding us. One is that that you can be pretty devastatingly blunt. Um, and uh, now. Uh, I think that's that's good. It's good and bad. I mean, it's good because we should compromise. And if something is what it is, it should be said for what it is. Um, you know, and you don't shy away from doing that. Uh, and also, this is uh, from the spiritual point of view. This is, this is what any guru would do: that he won't compromise the truth for for, for anyone's feelings. If a thing has to be said, it has has to be said. Um, uh um it, it it so that's that's you know and i noticed it specifically last week i think we were talking about how um you'd written a little mini essay there on klaus schwab and paul king's north and i made the comment that when i read that if if you had removed the two names and asked me to fill them in again i would have put them in the reversed place and then we had a discussion about why i would have got it wrong and what you actually meant which wasn't clear to me at the time and it probably wouldn't have been clear to certainly wouldn't have been clear to somebody like paul either i, I imagine um but you know this is where you, when, when you made some statements um uh, they probably need to be explained with the action at the time you actually make the statement to stop people getting you wrong rather than just letting it hang in the air um so that, that, that that's the first thing i wanted to say which was the aspect of of hugh and how hugh comes across uh the second thing is is the, the aspect of how we come across and you know maybe just as just as we might have to accept that the only people we're going to be able to have um a, a sort of real heart conversation with our people who are less well known, we might also have to start looking at ourselves uh, and just admitting that to most people we're just nut jobs. We've just, 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 we're just, you know, and we're going to have to accept that that's, that's how we come across. Uh, and I felt that reading the manifesto because as, as well written as it was and thorough and, and, and all the rest of it, when I looked at it, it seemed unavoidably still to have the tone of so many things you can read on the internet, which are just pretty fanciful, really, but they can be written up to sound quite plausible, uh, with, 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 you know, in the same style that you've done. And, and I thought, well, sure, you've tried to do a thorough, uh, conscientious job of it and all the rest of it. But to anyone who's coming to this for the first time, they're going to say, oh, my God, another whack, another whack job story, you know. Um, because, it, you know, uh, it, it can unfortunately too easily read like that. So they're, they're both, well, I'll keep quiet now because I just, it's really just the two points. It's, it's, the, it's your, your fairly blunt statements, which I think might need qualifying at times, and us just having to put up with, uh, uh, we're just going to have to be whack jobs and, and that's it, you know, and just if people are willing to come on and join us for a bit of fun uh, in, in our little circus, uh, 
that's great, but we're probably relying on people who come to us rather than trying to draw people. Uh, because you look at the people who are here now, uh, they, they're, they're here because they want to be, because they picked up, they've listened to something and, and, and they picked up the vibe and they hang on, there's something here. I'm going to stick with this for a little while. Like they haven't been, they haven't uh, been convinced by by. And nobody said you might you know, really should go over there and listen to these people because blah blah blah. But I don't think that's the case. I think most of them have probably just come because they've 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 uh, they've caught the scent of something, you know, and it resonates with something in them, and they've come by a natural a, a, a natural process, um, uh, you know rather than this sort of uphill battle of trying to win people over, you know, Alison and, and Darren and Spencer and and, and, uh, and not only those, but to all of the, the substantially larger list of people who never even, uh, either never replied to invitations or just said no immediately without even, you know. Um, anyway, sorry, I said I was going to keep quiet. Yeah, um, no, I always thought that, uh, we should never fight coming across as wackos. I always, I always, uh, I took it as read that we should, you know, just be wacko <laughs> and uh, and assume everybody thought thinks we crack, you know, complete cranks and nut jobs, which which we are. I mean, it's, the the point is that we we're, we're fulfilling a role, and the the role is the role of the fool. So we we're talking to mental people. <laughs> I mean, it's. How do you talk to people that are utterly fucking barking mad and uh, don't know it and, and you know, are living in an upside down world? And you have to approach them like a crazy person. It's, it's like 12 monkeys and the um, the character, what's the the, the posing character from uh, Bruce Willis, um, the guy in the middle? Of the, uh, the I don't know it that well. Somebody else might know it. I haven't seen the whole thing. Uh, Brad Pitt, yeah, yeah. So we're doing the Brad Pitt character, <laughs> and so, so yeah. Um, uh, I think that yeah. I never tried to hide the fact that we cranks. I thought you know you you can't convey this kind of information without being a crank. So you shouldn't just you shouldn't fight it. I mean, it's much worse to come across uh, try and be serious and then. You know, everybody finds out later. But hang on a minute, you're just a bunch of cranks. It's much better to to come in as a crank. And yeah, but I people, mean, hang on, there's something the, to this. <laughs> These guys are so the idea is ambiguity more than anything. And I, I tried to. Put oh that yeah, in but see, the thing so is, you you, you don't lose. Really know where I'm coming from. You you lose very straight people like Paul Kingsnell straight away. With that, you, you're not going to get them immediately just on account of that. They're not going to want to participate in that kind of thing. Like he's got a very. I never thought we should. I, I mean, I, the part of it is to deliberately. I mean, I spend a lot of time trying to filter those kind of people out. So, uh, you know, the, I mean, the the pity of people like Paul Kingsnorth is he's got a brain, and he he understands the problem. So, that, and the same with Alison is that, well, she's she's funny, but she's got the. I mean, they understand the problem, and so they they're worthwhile. It kind of it pains me from that point of view that you know here these people that actually get it, and then the next step is you know things like dandelions and <laughs> dandelions and peace and stuff. And it's like, come on, <laughs> it's so frustrating that they they can actually get it. But but um, I think uh, what we should do is uh, just forge ahead and get noticed so in other words do like an ama and just you know, basically just do standard marketing of of the whole you know um the whole idea of the flipping it. and with that the aim of getting to this kind of flat earth status and then when you are flat earth status if you, if we can you know it's, it's just a crapshoot if somebody picks it up and and you get noticed then all these other types Will will come and approach us to debunk us and you know argue against it. You see, if it gets popular, then everybody wants to get on the bandwagon and you know, try and nail a flat earther. But we should try and deliberately get to that status where people come to us. And and so we we 
we we are almost there. I mean, I, I like the farm podcasts, um, and there's another podcast guy who's I, who who wants to interview interview me. Um, and I said, well, here I'm just about to finish the manifesto, so read the manifesto first, and then we'll do the interview. But I think we should go for those kind of things and um, just build up our own status, and then you know all the talking heads will be forced to respond. Um, but if you, That's, yeah, um, if, the... you try and, if you try and work off their reflected glory, it's you know it's it doesn't really work, you know. But, but I mean, I, I think of us as we absurdist terrorists and we're playing the, the role of the fool. Um, and that role requires you to be ridiculous and be a crank. But also with slightly ambiguous. You don't know. With, so I, I hoped I got that across in the, in I, the manifesto. It didn't, I, I, I thought it wasn't all crank stuff because I put in like humor and stuff right from the start. So you, people don't know. You know, whether is this a joke? And so that's exactly what the tone I was trying to strike is you don't know whether it's a joke or it's supposed to be ridiculous. Is this if people are taking seriously? Exactly. It's the first time people think in their fucking lives. You know? I, I think your attitude is exact, reflects exactly what I think. I think that the fact that we are living, I mean, the definition of sane and insane is, is so much at the core of how we interact with people at the moment in this uh, situation with the COVID, etc. you know. So I think this attitude of, of coming out with, with, with our stuff as passing for, for, for crazy people, nuts and everything, is the best thing we can do. I, and I, I, that was my state of mind when I was interacting with Paul. You know, I was trying to continue on this tone with him, but we're interacting with people who are driven by a a strong alien cortex, a lot of logic, a lot of scientific and intellectual and also religious background. And we, we need to, 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 to keep where we are and certainly not join the cohort of rational speakers that are all over the internet, you know, collecting more and more viewers because they're, they're following the, they're following the narrative that we, we don't believe in. And, uh, yeah, your your attitude is is a hundred percent. I I think the jester is the way to go for our, for our little group. You know. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, we're hecklers. We're not we're not supposed to take the mic and give discourses and try and be learned and get everybody to you know, say that oh, you know, these these guys are the real McCoy. I mean, anybody that likes authoritarians is uh, is never going to be interested in in us because um we're just unusual and we're challenging but that's our role our role is to be wacky unusual and challenging so we, we we're terrorists um oops that's and we need to disturb we need to just disturb to be there just as a as a nuisance really do you know like a like a thorn and uh and i think that's why we get this reaction uh from a lot of people because they're they get this kind of because they don't they don't lift up the. They don't take the glove. They don't want to interact because we are we are doing something somewhere. We, we, you know, we, we're, we're, we're random. Dangerous. We're dangerous. And yeah, that's, maybe yeah. maybe that's what they sense. Um, yeah, they uh, do. I mean, it's it's like look, we're in a prison yard, and anybody knows you don't tackle the mad bastard in the corner of the prison yard, and, and we are that. We we that is, uh, I think, what we want to be. But that, that's what uh, it's the Socratic role, and it's uh, it's a sacred role. Socrates called him, said he was the gadfly. So it's like, you know, we we the gadfly of the gadfly. <laughs> it's like, um, I mean, uh, XR said that you know they were the gadfly on on power, and yeah, and saying like, well, yeah, but. That's taking yourself a little bit too serious as well. So we're the gadfly on the gadfly. But the yeah, everybody takes themselves so fucking seriously. <laughs> it's like this is not a good attitude to prepare yourself for what's coming. We we what what's coming is an incredible shit. We're on the Titanic, right? This is going to be ugly, and so and the time is very very short. You don't have time to sit around preening yourself and. Uh, you know, doing these lovely, ornate 
illuminated manuscript type <laughs> creative writing with full of dripping with truthiness that you know some somebody can just just sample it and be oh i'm enlightened by the elixir of darren or <laughs> paul king's North. it's basically you know you know it's like uh, emergency surgery time you know it's basically very very short if you're going to reach enlightenment now, it's it's hack surgery on your alien cortex. So you you got, you got to start the meatball surgery, man. It's not all this finessing and beautiful stuff, and that's it's evil. It's chloroform. See, one of the things that uh, I didn't labor too much in the manifesto, but uh, I think we're going to have to go over all this territory. Is is all of the dangers? I mean. Our aim is to survive what's coming. And if you're going to survive that, these guys are poison. They, they, I mean, the, the Christians and stuff like that, that's chloroform on the road. These guys are carpetbaggers, man. They, they're going to put, they, they're putting intellectual chloroform on people just as we're about to go through the worst shit humanity's ever seen. And, and these people are going to be sitting in the park in a circle singing Kumbaya and taking Kool-Aid. You do not want to go near these people. And yeah, and so, but Joe mentioned, Joe didn't like, oh, yeah, I wanted to get an okay from everybody to actually reply to Kings North. I, I want to just put a post in XR Med to just respond to him and just really kind of flame him <laughs> because uh, Joe didn't like the sound of that. But uh, it said this, you know, kind of alien cortex against alien cortex, which is absolutely correct. It's alien cortex against alien cortex. The, I think the thing that Joe missed is that it's not ego against ego, right? It's not our ego against, it's Paul it, it Kings North that's against his ego for sure, but it's not ego on our side. So we, we're a cult, right? We're an occult, uh, you know, part of a cult is to establish the in group and the out group. And, you know, part of the value of interacting with people like this is to establish that they're the out group and establish why. So that everybody can can see that you know this is uh, it's part of egregore building, but you, we're building up the the ego of the extinction arty in a way. It's a it's a con game because our ultimate aim is to get rid of all egos. So, but you you know you have to, as I said many times, you have to do this fake psychotherapy thing, this kind of counterintuitive thing. I think, I think, thing Joe, I think Joe's point was that we were having a private conversation by email uh, and he, he didn't he thought that publishing the e, the direct email and and you know the interaction was probably not uh correct but that doesn't stop us and I, I agree with him to a certain extent that doesn't stop us from or you to write something about the fact that we tried to to interact with somebody who was trying who was doing like a it's like the engineers that we talk about who try to apply the solution to the climate crisis. We have a religious person who's trying to apply his solution to first his problems, but certainly uh, our, our situation uh, completely negating that our work ethic and our way of thinking comes from old monastic religious um, ways of thinking that have brought us here in the first place. So that's where I wanted to challenge him. Um, but I mean, if we can, if you can write something, I think maybe we should abstain from using his private emails because I mean, it's not, it's not really good to do that. It's not good policy. Um, I, I think what, what, what do other people think about this? I think we've just kind of muddied the water a little bit because of that very frank thing that Hugh wrote. On, on XR Med, um, which is because the things on XR Med are <clears throat> sort of, in a way, they're kind of semi private communication because it's just really the select group who look at that. Um, and so, you know, if Kings North was to see something like that, he'd think we were having talking about him behind his back, even though it's, it is uh, it is publicly available, but. Uh, you, you need to know that it's there. Um, I, I think just going back to what Hugh said, the problem with so many of these people, uh, you know, you were talking about the, the intellectual chloroform, and I think um, a lot of these people, they get so far and they can't take the final step. Um, 
uh, you know, <clears throat> sort of fall back rather than than grappling with the, the what's involved with their awakening. Um, I noticed that with that William Reese talk that that was on, and he was amazing. But then again, you know, right near the end, he goes, "Oh, but we can have a a planned economic and population contraction." And I thought, oh, my God. He, like, he says all this stuff that makes perfect sense, and then right at the end he just throws it all down the drain by making a statement like that. In other words, he's got 99% of his journey accomplished, then at the last minute he just turns aside and just and just won't, won't go through to the logical conclusion. You know, that, no, look, we're definitely stuffed. Uh, and... You know, so therefore, a radically different perspective on this is required. But that, that, that's, I, I think we talk about it before. It, you know, uh, is it a crisis of the imagination that the people just turn aside for want of, uh, they turn aside at the last minute for want of being able to conceive of any other way of approaching existence? Um, Sorry, I'm not explaining that well. You know, no, it's, they, they it's got... much worse. It's it's much worse than that. It's uh, all of this is about the alien cortex and the death of the alien cortex. So what the alien cortex does is, at the moment of enlightenment, which where it will die, it does anything. It does absolutely anything to survive. So it's it's the ultimate trickster weasel, you know, snake in the grass. And so that people. Uh, it's it kind of uh, wants death. It's Thanatos, and then it, it wants life at the same time as Eros, and so it's continually just jockeying between the two. That it, it you know it's kind of the curiosity killed the cat. So it's kind of curious and it wants to know more, and then it, it starts to learn. Oh my God, we're fucked. It's con it's confronted with its death, and then it does this U-turn and the substitution and all those things that I say uh, slip in. So. It inverts the situation and substitutes the scapegoat. There's all this sacrifice and stuff that is done in religion. It's saying, here, take this goat, take this child, take take this wealth or something, take anything other than me. It's trying to negotiate with death as if it's some kind of warlord or something like that, some kind of strong man. And so that's what it does. It, it, so in the case of someone like Kingsnorth, to give him his due, this is not easy stuff, right? I mean, it... It pains me, people like Kingsmore pain me because they have the capacity to reach enlightenment, but they're not going to do it because they're cowards. They're fucking cowards. I mean, it's not to be too harsh, but it's very hard, especially if you have kids, to face your own death. So if you look at Kingsmore, he does Dark Mountain, all of that. Dark Mountain is, is a, a cry of pain. But at the, in case you guys don't get it, Dark Mountain is Golgotha. God, Dark Mountain is is Calgary. It's it's he knows he's going to be crucified on Dark Mountain, but he can't stay away from it. He makes the Dark Mountain part. He's following Christ's footsteps. This is all. It, it was very. It came across quite starkly in the Adam Curtis thing um, the, about transhumanism. It was a very good thing, but he went a lot into Hamilton and Price. Do you remember that thing? And and Price uh, were. There was a, an exquisite piece in it. Well, I thought it was exquisite, but uh, it was Price's daughter. Adam Curtis was interviewing. Now I'm going to have to put the fucking link in there. But anyway, it's Adam Cur Curtis was interviewing Price's daughter, and Price is reading this um, this letter. Uh, she's reading this letter from her father, and he's going psychotic. He's going Christian and going psychotic. This is good, right? This is, if it wasn't done in a Christian mode, it could be youth psychosis. He could actually basically break through to the other side. But he's not going to make it. Price doesn't make it. Why? Because of this Christian bullshit. So, what, so she, the, the bit in the, in the movie is she reads the letter and it says, you know, like, he's saying, you know, about this bit about the hounds of heaven. And she goes like, that's just like him, you know, what, what is even the hounds of heaven? And Adam Curtis immediately comes in there and says, the hounds of heaven is this poem by Chester, and I can't remember who it was. But anyway, what the hounds of heaven is, is, is about 
this Christianity thing. I mean, surely you've felt the draw of Christianity, that it's so nice and sweet and easy. You could just give in to this, this myth of Father Christmas, basically this imaginary friend in the sky. And you, you could, you know, that's so warm and cuddly and stuff. And you, it's just the chloroform that you just go for, right? It's it just, it's it's like giving up and just, you know, like, you know, basically going to sleep in the grass. Beautiful, you know. And, and so the, it's it's terribly attractive, but it's the makyo of the worst sort. And what Price does in the end is, uh, Price is is ultimately, you know, well, this is a personification of death, right? So the hounds of heaven are, you know, the, the hounds of just giving up on the struggle of life and having, you know, just just going to the night, going into the, you know, into the night. And so, so Price eventually, I mean, it's a fabulous story because it's all about, um, you know, do we have uh, free choice or is it all just dominated by our selfish genes? Or are we just a vehicle for our selfish genes? You know, Price and Hamilton are the neo-Darwinists, with, along with Dickie Dawkins, that popularized this idea that, you know, the, the element, the only thing, the element of the unique element that survives the soul in other words, that survives for eternity is really our genes. And it's just using our body and brain and stuff just to propagate itself. That's it. And so if you take that conception, then then it made a crisis, a crisis of psychosis for, for price. And so he got more and more into the Christian thing. What he's, he's romancing is death. And then eventually he, he cuts his own artery with nail scissors. And there's a the guy who in the interview in with Adam Curtis he he gives the reason why that guy had a lot of perception, and it was because that's the ultimate, ultimate expression of free will, to say because God wouldn't want you to cut your artery, and your genes would be fatal for you to do that, so it was an ultimate expression of victory over you know the the all these forces that control you. Here, look out how sick it is. It's his alien cortex that wants to establish itself as uh, undying and, and to show defiance in, in the face of, of this, you know, of his approaching death, which he calls God. And it's the same in King's North, uh, King's North way. You can see, see in his right, he's, he's, he can feel the hounds of heaven. It's very difficult to accept your death this, or, or this coming collapse. Um, because he's got young kids. He's, he, he can see the system for what it is. He knows, you know, that it's a death camp. He, just like Jesus, knew that, you know, the Roman world in that time was a, a freaking death camp. And so, you know, he's creeping towards, like, giving up, just, just going into the night. And why go through this big bother? And that's what Christianity is. It's saying, like, just give up. Just go on the cross, come up to Jesus, and you know, you'll have a turn and end the struggle, end the struggle. That's all it's about. But it's 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 an abomination. We're not about that. We're about life and content and continuity of life. So the extinction idea is about not going extinct. <laughs> but all these guys will will pursue death. They they they're pursuing the personification of death. They, the God of the Bible, Yahweh and stuff, he's the guy with the scythe. He's Saturn. He's Kronos. He's, he represents death. And, and so all of this is a big song and dance, you know, until you give yourself up to death. And it's like, it's hideous. We're team human. We're all about life. We, we're about escaping the fucking side, not giving up to it, but to... The, uh, the irony of it, if, if your alien cortex wins, like it did in Price's case, it will snuff you out. That's what I tried to say in the manifesto, is our biggest danger, is that on a large scale, is, is the cutting of the artery with the, with the nail scissors on a global scale. There are a lot of guys who have, you know, finger on the red button, people like Biden. I mean, can you imagine Biden has the fate of the humanity? I posted that thing about cobalt bombs. 
that's in the hands of a cretin that can, you can't even stay awake in a climate com conference, which is all about waking humanity up. That guys like Putin are psychopaths. Guys like Xi Jinping, which is a, a walking monster. And, they, and, and like these guys have this power at their fingertips. You think they won't fucking use it to prove a point like, like Price did on himself? It all depends on how big their ego is, right? So Xi Jinping's ego is the size of China. If Xi Jinping goes down, will he take China with him? Sure he will. So if, if one of these guys gets supreme power, messianic power like Klaus Schwab would want, right? It's like if one of those guys gets that kind of power, when they go, you'll all go. We'll all go. I mean, go back to the Ming emperors and those the guys. What's the guy buried in China in the with the terracotta army? I can't remember who his name was. But anyway, if you have a look at that story, you know what those terracotta guys were. Were you know basically all these guys that should have been entombed with them, right? He's a great emperor. They should have been entombed. You can see what happened. Is they they said, ah, uh, I know. Instead of me actually being covered in gravel how about i just make a nice terracotta effigy of myself and pay for it and substitute you know alien cortex substitution and so they they must have got away with it because now they are thousands and thousands of terracotta soldiers and stuff but what they must have been doing was doing a proxy for themselves because in tombs from pharaohs to emperors and stuff they demand that their people die with them that they're in the mind of a psychopath these people are sheep. They're just extensions, limbs of the of themselves. So when they die, you know, you look, think about it. When you die, do you like the thought of your arm living on? If your arms are, oh, well, I'm going to die, but you know, my arm's going to be severed and it's going to crawl about for the rest. Of, it's a creepy idea. You'd say, no, I want that arm to die with me. That's how they think in terms of nations. That's how they think in terms of the whole of humanity. It's terribly dangerous because... We, we need some part of humanity to survive, right, and and make it through. We are the seed that makes it through. Or if not, try, you know, we're one of the butterflies that flap its wings and try to make it through. So it's like, it's, it's like somebody should make it through. It's Consciousness is far too precious to snuff it out on some Christian myth, right? It's like there's way more important that hum, humanity lives on to experience life and to propagate and have more children but if you get stuck in your own little king's north world with a couple of kids and stuff then it's like that's the whole kingdom of heaven and you just you know the, that's all that's important so then you you get these silly notions like christ and you know people in the sky like there's a big man in the sky and you can read about him in the bible it's like this is horseshit you can't give up on the pain of that. Of look, collapse is is terrible. Our civilization is wonderful. I mean, <laughs> I hate to say it on the record, but look what we've done. Look what we've achieved. It's wonderful. It's glorious, and it's utterly, utterly stupid. So it's, it's, but it's fantastic. It's a fantastic play, and to 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 end it, you know, in because you just can't take the pain. <laughs> It's not us. It's just not us. Yeah. So it's just like, so, but, you know, these people must be be challenged with what they're doing. Because if, if we're all on the Titanic, uh, or these people that go, uh, you know, that get that this, this ship's going down. Okay, the vast majority of people, they don't fucking get it. They only one or two know, you know, oh, shit, this is going to be real bad. This ship is going to sink. And the vast majority of people are all just playing and, you know, farting around and they trust all the crew. <laughs> or read the body language of the crew. This ship ain't going to float much longer. Just look at their fucking body language, dudes. And um, but everybody's, you know, partying and stuff like that. Well, but on the Titanic. If you see people that know that the ship's going down and then they go and hide in a cabin, which is kind of what XR and stuff is doing, I think Faulty's doing it to a certain extent, is they go and try and find a waterproof cabin on the Titanic and then say, like, well, I'm in a waterproof cabin, so <laughs> I'm okay. It's like, no, we're all on 
this shit together. You can't let people get away with that kind of ignorance. Because that, that's the kind of ignorance that's going to cost every man on the ship. You so, know, you know what you're saying reflects it reflects very much the conclusion of the last email that we will not. Well, I've sent it to everybody here, so everybody here is free to read it on their email. But the last phrase of that last email that we told me not to write back is, um, "I can see why the demands of Christianity make you uncomfortable," and that that just made it. The demands of Christianity make me uncomfortable. I mean, that's it. What can you say there? Like you're just in front of somebody who's got not only a waterproof cabin, but a padded cabin with a torture machines inside, like because the demands. Yeah, you know? it's got a fucking halo on it. No? Yeah, it's like, I remember. I've, I've got my waterproof cabin and a fucking halo, and and that you know that it 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 drips with you know, um, basically misanthropy, which I think he, he accuses us of. But but it's 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 just this frozen chosen thing, is just horrible, man. It's it's bad for the person and it's bad for everybody else. But you see, if you don't challenge them, if you do kind of what Joe said, and you be polite and you you allow people their their foibles and so if you say no, this game is far too serious for that. It's like if you allow them their foibles, they they are not neutral. They recruit them. See what what they're doing. People like Kings North. Is he he's not he's writing for his own satisfaction, of course, and it's kind of palliative. But he's also recruiting. He's also basically getting a cult right together. So, but you know, it's it's the like the communists. They 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 wheedle up to you and say, you know, like oh, you know, Karl Marx was was actually an environmentalist. <laughs> You're like. What the fuck <laughs> was like? Uh, Karl Marx was actually vegan, and, and you go, for fuck's sake, fuck off! And then they 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 quickly scamper off. You see, they do that online. There's a big recruiting campaign from all the communists. And you, they do that all over the place. They sidle up to people, you know, and they they, they know that if they start a debate or anything like that, it it, uh, it, it triggers the algorithm, and then you know. Communism gets a lot of <coughs> so they quickly scurry off. But the Christians do it too. They do this kind of easily little, you know, try it on, try it on, try it on. That's psychopathic behavior. That's what psychopaths do. It's like, can I push your buttons? Let me try this one. Let me. Oh, I response, response. Ooh, ooh. And they might as well be putting fucking electrodes in your head and stimulating you. It's fucking evil what these Christians and these people are doing. So it's like. Yeah, you know, uh, the the truth of it is what I said in the manifesto is everything's a cult, right? Everybody's recruiting for for their vehicle, and and so you 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 can't go around saying slapping people's hands and saying bad Christian, bad communist. <laughs> it's like they they are trying to build their own egregore. It it is the super organism trying to integrate itself on a large scale, but. Um, you know, Klaus Schwab is doing exactly the same thing. The one world and stuff. It's this. They just have different versions of the super organism. And for you, so you can't uh, fight it uh, head on by trying to block them. The only way I think you can do it is what we're doing. And that's basically you make a, an alternative cult that, that challenges, challenges other people. Because if you have your own cult and, um, that stands in opposition, you know, in the marketplace of <laughs> cults and egregores, uh, it st it stands as a challenge to to all these these other mega mega formations of the human mind. All of these all of these formations, all of these uh, hive minds and uh, meta minds and stuff, and, you know, all these guys doing in the intellectual dark web doing sense making. They're also doing an egregore. Sense making means you know, getting all this kind of like-minded thought. It is this uh, expanded consciousness trying to, you know, get to human consciousness, exactly like Ken Wilber and all these woo-woo, Eric Ottol and all these guys. It, 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 everybody can feel us integrating in this expanded consciousness. But, like, this, this is dangerous, people. This is fucking, fucking dangerous. This talk about unity and stuff is poison. Because what it means is we all go down. You know, this this ship is going down, right? So if 
if we if you go for this big woo woo thing with everybody's all brothers and sisters and the lion lies down with the lamb, when the lion die, lies down with the lamb, that's the end of the fucking story. You do not want the lion to lie down with the lamb. All these guys like Jim Bendel and Kings North and that, they're all getting to this thing where they, they themselves are reconciling all these parts within themselves. They're not reconciling themselves with the truth, which means reconciling themselves with death. They're reconciling lies. They're getting all the lies in, with, internally to shake hands. That's, that's an abomination. It's a substitution for real enlightenment. In, in real enlightenment, you really challenge each one of, of these domains of disagreement and these cognitive dissonances that you have until they actually have, you know, one beats the other, right? That, that is the correct transformation. It's not good to have all these dissonances and that you, you allow them to shake hands. So, so this is a difficult concept because in the bigger scheme of things in say a tribal level or population level, we need tribes, we need tribalism. It's good, it stops pandemics. It, it means there's diversity. It means that you, nature has a lot of spins of the dice, right? But you need to integrate yourself in, on, in a whole in, uh, at the individual level. So in, uh, if you, unless you, to get to Jungian kind of individuation, you need a, rec a reconciliation of opposites but not by some entente cordiale or some kind of fraud. You actually have to fight it out. Make the, make the different ideas in your own head, the different personalities inside you, fight it out until you reach the truth. The reconciliation of these opposites is, not, is, is an abomination. That's what your alien cortex is doing to make sure that you never defeat it, that, that it, it never gets... Um, it extinguished as an individual ego. So you want extinction of the individual ego so that you can you can accept your fate as part of the bigger whole, as part of nature and earth, and a, a mortal that dies, right? That's that's the goal. But you, you don't want yourself to stay an individual. You don't want to die an individual with a fucking halo. But that's an abomination. That's what your alien cortex wants you to do, to die like price, but cutting your artery. It's like that, that's, that's the epitome of evil. That goes against life. life. Life's a struggle and the struggle continues. But you can only face the struggle and enjoy the game when, once you've actually died, you know. And all these people are trying not to die. But they, they're not living. They're not living because it, they've substituted their life for just a struggle not to die. It's like that's not living. The, you know, all the people in Britain today are just trying not to die. And they're not living. That's not living. If you go into the metaverse, it's just basically soporific. So it's trying to stop you facing your, your mortality. And so, you know, it's just, just another attempt not to die. And it's like, no, the way to do it is to die. And die early. You're supposed to die in your teens. It's supposed to be an initiation right? The, you see, the, they always the substitute. You see, it's a real death. It's a very real death in a very real sense. It's very close to a physical death. As close as makes no difference. But you see, the alien cortex comes along with the Christian thing and substitutes, say, baptism. And then it's a symbolic death. And so that's not fucking good enough. Don't substitute Christian rebirth and a rebirth in Christ and stuff. No. <laughs> Real, real solid fucking death with the extinction anti desiderata number eight, which is you don't actually do it physically. So you get to exactly where Price got to, even if it means putting the, the scissors up against your, your, your artery, but you remember desiderata number eight at that point, and you do not do any physical injury. But that's the point you want to get to. You want to get to that point where you're ready to do it, and then you'll see the light. But yeah, Christians are evil. I I must do a lot more on this. I, I've I've had you know, I've had a lot of material that are building up for a video on exactly this topic, but I've held back on it because 
you get such a bad reaction from, you know, you just basically hemorrhage views. So the, the, yeah, this, but, this will hemorrhage views. Well, but why, why approach it like that uh, as saying they're evil? I mean, what's happening here is um, they're failing to grasp the, the spiritual point. Um, it's, you know, it's the miss, it's the sin. Um, and yet, I, I, in a certain sense, I'm just taking on that, that uh, feeling that Joe must have had um, because, um, you know, you, 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 can, you can have your tirade against Christianity as being evil, but that kind of gets people's response, you know, and as you're just saying, they'll just go or they'll, they'll you know, write you off. Um, that it, it, it might be better to put the effort into um, getting them to see what they've missed because it, that's, that's terribly difficult. I, I mean, we live in a time where no, they that... know. They know what they miss. That's why it's evil. You see, I wonder you see, whether the reason, they do. The reason why they run, the reason why people will, will listen to this and many people mm. will, will run is because they know what I'm saying. It's only the dumb ones in a certain respect that hang around. You, you have to be a little bit dumb to get enlightened. The really smart ones can smell it, mm, yeah, and they run. Yeah. I don't know whether they can smell it literally enough. They just say they, they're aware of some kind of danger and they, or some kind of threat, and they run. But they, if you ask them what it was, I don't think they will be able to tell you. Oh they, yeah, they yeah would no, just... no, it's 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 not. Yeah, it's it's subliminal. Right. It's, it's, yeah, but this is what I mean. I think you have to. The, the, the purpose of the exercise is to bring that out so that it's quite clear what you're talking about. Um, uh, well, it's it's an art. You see, you you kind of bug it either way. You see, this mm. this is we've been through this before. I think we went through this with with Lady Ella, and I think I think well, we've been through it. Also so challenged me with, on this is. It's like you're yeah. kind of screwed. If you pussyfoot around, you know, you, you're going to – what this is is sacrificing the bull, right? This is the, the Mithraeus toroctomy. Mm -hmm. That bull is your alien cortex, right? So, And, and the sword is is Price's sword, right? It's uh, Price's nail, <laughs> nail clippers. Is it, so you, you're going to – you know, it's like – there's a long journey for the bull to get to the altar to – to be slaughtered and if you go you know pussy pussy footy 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 it doesn't matter you can do you can waste out an ordinate lot of time and then it'll turn around at the last moment just like king's north did he smelt he smelt in the extinction army exactly what's gonna happen oh <laughs> yes and but, he turns uh, and runs. You, you, but it's better if you he can runs still early, right? it's better if he runs early uh, than you invest a lot of time into something where well, then you just don't get to the goal. I'm still wondering whether you can bring this out into the light uh, w without um, – well, you've got to be confronting. It's going to end up being confronting one way or the other, but it, rather well, you've than got bringing to get it down out – the elephant in the room. At some stage, you've got to get down to price tax. So it, it, doesn't, yeah, it doesn't matter yeah. how much preliminary sweet talking you do. It's like if, if the maiden isn't up for it, she's not up for it. No, it but I'm not how much whining and dining you do. She'll take all the whining and dining, but she does not intend to submit. No, but I think there's a difference between uh, attacking someone because they won't acknowledge or can't see the element, the, the elephant in the room, or taking another point, taking a, 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 you know a, a a more positive take on it, it's not the right word, of, of instead instead of attacking them because they won't recognise this or, or or can't see it, is suggest that, you know, uh, there is an elephant in the room and, and would they like to, to to sort of explore with me and see if they can spot the thing. You know, in other words, lead them to it. Don't lead them to lead them to it, don't sort of drive them to it or don't drive them or don't lead them to it by attacking where they're already at um, because it shuts down the it, it, it kind of shuts down the procedure once once people feel good I guess what I'm trying to say is is you know 
try and do it without um, having a you know full frontal attack on the sacred the the, the shibboleths that they, that they've got already. Um, it, it's not an easy thing here, you know. And I, I mean, just personally, when I think back, if I'd just been left alone, not bothered to read books or look at things, or you know, just just had a, had a more ordinary life uh, and lived with my concerns about there's something not right. I think I'm missing something here. I'm, I, I know I'm missing something big, but I don't know what it is. I don't think I could have arrived at a, a, a sort of a grasp of the spiritual point without some some somebody to give me a fucking clue. Uh, and you know, I I wonder whether people like Kingsnorth need a little. I know you said that he's pretty well with it, but uh, he, you know, he, he needs to be suggested to him that what he's looking for is going to lie lie outside of what his mind's generating. And and this philo philosophy that he's got, because he what, what he's doing is going down this path of being a philosopher, and the path of philosophers always leads you to turn aside from the spiritual point at the last minute and go off at a strange angle. It never it never takes the final step over the threshold. Um, uh, so what, you know, I'm suggesting that you've got to. It might be better to be suggesting this to people. Because they obviously haven't, they haven't got it, uh, and yet it's not a piece of knowledge. Um, it's not as if you're giving them really a piece of information. You, you're actually s s just, I guess, stopping their alien cortex from it and saying, "Hey, instead of trying to think your way out of it, try not thinking your way out of it." You know, just stopping but that process. This is not persuasion, right? This, this is, this is not uh, like. So the communists, all these tankies and stuff like that, they try and recruit by persuasion and argument. And that, that's pharisaical. We're not Pharisees, right? The, the, uh, we're, in a, we're shamans. And, uh, you know, people can only actually be helped when they know that they're sick. So these people are the worst kind of sickness because they know they're sick, but they refuse to admit it. So there's only one thing where people have to reach rock bottom to actually be to actually start on this path or actually get anywhere, you have to reach rock bottom. While while you still have hope and you still have the means to carry on this tap dance and have your strength, uh, you you never nobody's going to convince you of anything. I mean, have have you ever convinced anybody? Of anything? It's like it's incredibly difficult, and the only way you can do it is. If they get to the point where they think, okay, I can do this harmlessly. But if, if they it, get a smell that's saying, this is going to cure me of my insanity, you're not going to get there. So you can't get there softly and by persuasion. You just have to give people an astounding shock. And then they, from that shock, they, they might, yeah. uh, it, it might invoke a change. But yeah, these people are essentially like alcoholics. And a lot of the Philosopher types are kind of intellectual alcoholics. They get a, a very small dopamine hit when they get a clever idea, and they get you know lots of uh, like Stephen Pinker. He he just about purrs when you you know if you see somebody praising his book or or something like that because they get a little micro dopamine hit from being clever, and so they they on the they alcoholics right, and so like an alcoholic at the bar or. An, uh, you, you can't persuade them to stop drinking. You're just never going to fucking do it. You bet, but you can do something. You, you can smack them in the face. Say, like, say like you're drunk. Bam! <laughs> it's like, oh, what, like what, me? I, I never get drunk. Well, well, then why did I fucking hit you in the face? <laughs> I, I suppose that's <laughs> the thing. That, that the, you, they got the most... a car crash. And it's like, yeah, you can give somebody a fucking car crash. Yeah, I guess the, the tragedy is that the most alien thing to us is a, a momentary stopping of the alien cortex. Yeah, that, and you, it, I mean, the elites know this. The, the elites use the stock jo do, uh, shock doctrine on a large scale. So w when you see a spectacular like 9-11, <laughs> 
what's happened recently is <laughs> it's got it written all over it. But yeah, a lot of people think, yeah, you know, oh well, they'll never use nuclear weapons. Of course, they'll use nuclear weapons. Go and have a look at Iraq. It was shock and awe. They used shock and awe. In, it's like that they, they've done it on everybody else around the block. So it's like now it's your turn. Now the the soldiers come home. They're gonna do it on us. Right? They've perfected it. Or oh, go and have a look at the guys in Iraq. They're not they're not unnew, they're not somebody else, they're not the other. The guys in Iraq are us from the future, right? We are going to get the treat. Do you honestly think guys like Blair and and Bush and Cheney and you know Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell and Wolfowitz and Billy Crystal and all. Do you honestly think those guys are going to treat their own people better than the Iraqis? Of course not. When it comes down to the wire, we are the fucking Iraqi civilians. So they're going to use shock and awe on us. right? You, well, you better get your shock up front. Right? So if, if you shocked out of, if you shocked into being a ghost, Right, then you're a real warrior. Then you can take battle. Right? In all training, in all militaries, they they have a process. Basic training is a tra is 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 kind of training that you would get in an in an ashram for a spiritual realm. Is they they break you down psychologically and then build you up as a unit. That's standard all over the world, back to the ancient Sumerians. And so you know that. The only way you can actually survive, and part of that training is to sort of give you exposure to battle. So, for example, we were, they, they find excuses to put you in a dugout in a trench, um, you know, with a target behind your head, and then people shoot at you because they want to give you training for what it's going to be like with a battle. They, they do it with horses, like military horses, they fire rifles in the air, you know, next to their head until they don't bolt. They habituate you to the shock. And that's the only way that you can actually win this big shock that's going to come. When they use the shock doctrine on us, the only defense you have against it is habituation to shock. Now, nobody is habituated to shock. They're all fucking sheep. They barely need to let off a firecracker and everybody's running for a fucking jab. So it's like, you know, this is going to be ugly. Right? They, we're in a lifeboat with 8 billion people. They need to whittle down to 500 million. This is going to be brutal. I don't sidle up to a Christian and say, I'm going to stick with you. You'll get me through this. It's like they're the first to go. See, here's the thing. When when the guys in Auschwitz, I once read this, that when the guys in Auschwitz, when they arrived in Auschwitz, I always tried to think myself into these situations, try and get what it, you know, on both sides. What was it like to be a guard in Auschwitz? And I never let that problem go until I absolutely understood and identified them. And then, do you know, how is it like to be a, a, an inmate in one of those things? And read about it until I never let it go. I've done this all my life. Never let it go until I absolutely feel like I understand perfectly what it was to be one of those guys. And so in the course of that, and I read that, when the guys came to Auschwitz, this is the experience. The, the big, you know, cattle car rolls up. They open the doors. They get everybody to They try and make them into soldiers. Why? Because they, they're SS, right? They're soldiers. And so they use what they learned in basic training from them, and they try and get civilians to line up like soldiers. Right? Now they're going to do triage. There's a guy on a table. He's a doctor. And he, they bring all the guys one by one, come to the table. And the guy says... You know, he looks them up and down, checks their teeth, does a basic examination. And he says, left or right? Now, if you go to the left, there's a mean looking couple and he's got a fat, fat stick. And there are lots of miserable looking fucks standing in the ranks that go there. That's the left side. On the right side is this little door, which is kind of like a little passage, right? And it's all got flowers on it. And it's got the Star of David. Uh, I think they even had lovely music coming out of it, if I'm not over-embellishing it. Guess where everybody wanted to go? Everybody that went up to the table, do you think they wanted to go to the right or the left? 
You know where the left led, right? You know where the left led. All the derelicts went straight to the gas chambers through that door that they all wanted to go to with painted with flowers and <laughs> that on the other side of that was the death chambers. No one wanted to go into the ranks where obviously they were building labor parties, but that was the route, the route to survival of the death camps, the route to the end of the death camps, the route to the thinking that gave the death camps was to the right, the hard part. Were Christians, so tell me, what do you think Kings North wants? He wants a palliative. He wants to go into the little door with the flowers on and keep his halo. And that's why he goes for Bulgarian Orthodox Church. Why? Because it's all flowery and nice and gilt and it's got all the spells and smells and all, all the trappings of, you know, salvation. It's, it's a peaceful, nice death. Don't do it. But anyway, you have to shock people. <laughs> If, um, if, in it's the, in like being a so, so just one more example. This is not, uh, this is well known in, in things like if you've been a diver, you'll know this. If you, you'll know about nitrogen narcosis, talk to somebody who's been in nitrogen narcosis. So I spoke to some guy who very very nearly died, and uh, from nitrogen narcosis. And the reason was he got to like a hundred feet or something, and he carried on down. <laughs> he just carried on swimming down and down and down. <laughs> And he said after us, why did you carry on swimming down? And he said, I thought that there were there were dolphins. He said he, he literally saw dolphins and they were beckoning him down. He said they were like angels. He said it was the most beautiful experience he's ever had. But swimming down basically makes your nitrogen narcosis worse. And so the only reason why he's alive, he said, well, what stopped you? Why didn't you just carry on down and be dead now? And he said, just something snapped. There was a tiny little voice in my head that said, this is wrong. There's something wrong. And he said, that that saved me. I suddenly just, just something like snap. And he suddenly realized, nitrogen, narcosis. And that saved his life. But it's it's the same with, uh, you know, with all these outs. It's, you you need that that, <laughs> that little reminder that this, there's something wrong. And you have it. Go into a church. You go into a fucking church and tell me you can't tell me something wrong. There's a fucking dead guy up on the fucking wall in front of the church. This is not right, people. This, this is this is evil. If 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 you went to the church for the very first time, like a Viking or something, went into a church for the very first time in their adulthood, they were appalled. Saint Paul. <laughs> Because it's fucking horrible. I mean, you, you, all the lights and the beautiful colors and all this ritualizing, and there's a fucking piece of meat up on a stick in the front. Of it. You know this is evil. You know it. But because you introduced yeah. it here, it's like, it's terrible. I, I go to a bit because uh, my mother used to drag me to church every Sunday. Um, uh, and... Uh, yeah, that's that's one of my most vivid memories. It was just a perplexity at these, this, this rotten symbolism. You know, the, the the suffering hanging up all over the the fucking place. I I, I you know, it's really distressing. Um, I wanted to ask you about because you mentioned uh, once before in some context I, I can't remember about. Uh, being sort of post-traumatic stressed and uh, you know what you were saying a minute ago about how the military breaks you down then builds you back into this unit or how the cult will will um, will uh, break down your uh, your ego and this kind of thing um, uh, but what I, I just wanted to ask you a question about that what what, what happens to the psychological damage there you know is that there's, why you you made that comment about none. having some there's none why which why did you make a point about having ptsd for instance or so was the, it in the, a different the, context the ptsd comes because because it's unresolved right mm. I, I mean i got ptsd from uh 
from all the experiences I had, but I didn't I didn't know at the time. I thought I was beyond all of it. It took me a long time. Uh, it basically took me seven years in in London to to really see it from a perspective and then realize uh, that you know I had PTSD and everybody everybody in South Africa had it. everybody living in South Africa right now has PTSD. Yeah, know. but I, I'm I'm looking at I, I wanted to just take it a little step further. That, um, for instance, in the in the uh, ashram situation, where, where uh, you know, I suppose ideally at the end of the process, a person loses their their egoic identity. Um, but is there a kind of a psychological residue still there in terms of the trauma of that killing? Is that no, still absolutely. lingering? There? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is a very good point because, you see, what people don't account for is the, the pre-traumatic stress disorder. See, everybody in the Western world has pre-traumatic uh, stress disorder. You don't, you don't get out of the stress. So after enlightenment... There's a common misunderstanding by and perpetuated by a lot of these fake gurus and Paul Kings North types that they, you know, they exude all the sattva and all the spirituality and stuff like that. And then everybody thinks, oh, if you become like the Buddha or you become like Muhammad or you know, Christ, then everything goes smoothly. You just wander around with a pink cloud and rose petals are scattered at your feet and, you know, the tax man never comes after you and policemen say, you know, fall down at their feet and worship you and stuff like that. And it's like, it's a lie. There's, there's so many people selling that lie. I'll tell you what happens after enlightenment. It's eupsychosis. So basically, it's traumatic. It's a death experience. You are like somebody who's come out of the other side. You have PTSD for the rest of your life. But it's better than pre-stress disorder. <laughs> And the reason is because you, you're remote from it, right? So, in, in other words, it'll catch you. You see, the, th the thing is that I, uh, although I had PTSD, I didn't recognize it because I couldn't, it took me a long time to see that some of the behaviors that I was doing was were, were not quite right, right? Um, I don't want to go into details and stuff, but but I, I could gradually see from a kind of objective third person point of view that like, you know, this, that's not quite, <laughs> quite right. But you see, then I could see it and deal with it. Just seeing it was enough to deal with it. The thing is, there was no emotional content in there. You see, but, but, so it's kind of like uh, you look at your body from and your behavior and stuff from an objective third person point of view. You, yeah, before in life, no, that, that, you're completely vested in your thing. You, you're a scared rabbit. You, in that, you're rabbit. identifying with it. Yeah, you identify with yeah. it, mm. and you're completely running around, you know, seeking, and there's this restlessness. So you you're in a mm. point of peace that other people will wouldn't recognize. You know, is a, a lot of uh, people. Yeah. It's, it's very challenging, especially for people on a spiritual path. Um, and I can give lots of examples of this. But, uh, you know, I, I think I've given a few, especially with this, this one guy who was, I went to India with on this pilgrimage. And he was very into Buddhism, you know, talking shaved head and ochre robes and the full tilt, you know. And he, he was very proud of the fact that he had spiritually advanced and stuff. You get a lot of the stuff, especially in Buddhism. I don't know why, but anyway, they, they, you know, they they have a few cities and they like, oh, they think they're the top of the world and stuff. And so, so if you come to them and say like, you know, they think they're going to reach enlightenment maybe in five lifetimes. <laughs> and you say like, dude, enlightenment's not a big deal. Like, say like mm. you should do it in at least two years and they're like, oh and then like and then i get into this kind of debate and stuff like that because they they want to believe that it's you know some kind of perfection and stuff and it, it's not it's almost the opposite in a way it, it, it turns you into a genuine human being and so yeah you know, we're guys 
We're chumps, man. <laughs> We're primates. So everybody pre enlightenment just means you get that you're a chimp. Yeah. All this other stuff is denial, substitution, deflection, diversion. It's all this big game to pretend we're just a fucking mortal chimp. So you, you only become normal <laughs> after this. So uh, chimps have PTSD. Yeah, you look at a baboon or a <laughs> chimp in the wild and tell me they haven't got PTSD. They all got, that's the price of life. Yeah, but there is a point you can get to where you can <laughs> stand aloof from it. Uh, and more than that, it's it's a it's a sense of serene beauty, but you don't want to say that because immediately then everybody goes, oh, pink cloud. <laughs> no, not pink cloud. Fuck pink cloud. Fuck the sattva. So it's very difficult because you're trying to communicate to people in pre-enlightenment speech about a world. That yeah, but that's what I'm just saying, that using words like serene, beauty, peace, Love, is, love. Don't want to use love. And That's a horrid uh, one. Yeah, the the very uh, is. They never experience love. So so, you, you know, it's not in their current in their vocabulary. But then then these guys are all. That's all the words they use. You know, it's better they shut up. Yeah, thanks for that. I, I appreciate that. I, I was interested in just exploring it a little bit. Uh, uh, just personally, I. I notice that where um, you know what you were saying about noticing this externally r rather than um, uh, you know I mean I've read about PTSD and some other things that people tend to have if they've been through a nasty time and I thought to myself no 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 I don't think that fits me you know but then if I then look at myself from the outside and say, hang on, what do you look like looking at this from, from outside of yourself? And thinking, yeah, well, that's what my diagnosis would be, a PTSD. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. It, it, it's as though more or less what you've just said, that you, you found it from the outside of yourself rather than the in, inside of yourself. And I'm not explaining that very well, but you, you didn't. Yeah. yeah, you know, you you they, yeah. you you didn't have an identification with it in there already. Um, you, you know, you just came across it later and thought, "Oh, hang on, yeah." A, a, you know, if anybody else saw a person who was feeling like that and behaving like that, and and and, and who had experiences like that, they'd say, "Oh, yeah, I'd diagnose you like that." Uh, and think, "Oh, that's surprising," because I would never have felt that uh, for myself. You know. Um, yeah, well, what what caught me is the that I was very good under stressful situations. So, mm. so I've been through so much stress in my life that 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 I never saw the PTSD because I could I was even even now in stressful situations people remark like the you know boat uh, last year got in into a big storm and it was a collision and. Everybody remarked about how calm I was, but I'm very, very good in those stressful situations. What got me was the absolutely peaceful one. So when when I never when there were no demands on me and stuff, then I noticed it. So I only noticed it going to Britain because it was, you know, such a safe, closeted, peaceful place. And then I noticed I couldn't uh, I couldn't bear it. I needed the drama. Yeah. But... Can, I, can I say something quite personal there? I usually don't, but I I just when you've been talking there, there's some a flow of of experiences came back to me, and I I just wanted to to talk about it because I mean why not? It's bursting out. Yeah, of go me. ahead. Yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know, when I was when I was just going to reach fifteen, I I I died. Well, I died. <laughs> Um, my my sister was killed in front of me by a car and all the family and I was there on the on the scene covered with blood and I mean now that you're talking about an initiation and the shock and everything um, I remember the this this for my life of course because it's a and uh, 
I was immediately faced with um, the reaction of the church first, who tried to to come to me, to us, and I actually remember kicking them out of my house. I, I don't know how I did that at not even 15. I remember fighting against it when I went to church and everything afterwards. I remember uh, very well the, the refusal to comply and the change that operated in me. Like you talk about a teenage initiation, a, a kind of a death. I was a person before the event and after that a completely different person. It put me on a path, of course, of enormous PTSD because I started to to, to, you know, everything was, and I was constantly like that, but it was a me before and after. I was, I can't explain exactly in words because I, I went, I stepped into life, another person, and it stayed with me. And like you, I didn't recognize PTSD and I probably didn't follow this, what you went through with enlightenment and things like that. But I, <clears throat> I thread a path of very isolated, nearly adult uh, already in the middle of teenagers and it stayed with me and I realized what you said about being good under stress I went I stepped into a profession where I was in constant I mean you know delivering and operating blood and being in in emergencies and stuff like that with a perfect kind of level thing and the same thing as you when I was in a peaceful and the kind of serene atmosphere that's when i detected but i did the same thing as you i didn't identify with the ptsd i was not the ptsd it was not me it was there i was observing it all through my life until i came to a point where you know i had to uh, to, to to live with it and actually it's part of me and i'm not trying to treat it <laughs> you know it's not i'm not taking that attitude but i wanted to share this this kind of bathing in blood thing that happened that suddenly brought me from one side a, a girl i knew me compliant good good daughter a good student good everything and suddenly the other person that came out with thoughts of anarchy rejection of my family of my society of everything around me a total rebel expelled da -da, went through all sorts of things and i there was a a turning point um where the shock of the event kind of just propelled me into where I am now. And, you know, I, I, uh, I can really understand the initiation of young people and what they miss by not, I'm not wishing on anybody what I went through, but what I mean is that in the society we live in, unfortunately, um, things like that can be presented. And, uh, and also I remember how the cross, the, the, the church people try to to present you with this denial of death and you know come with us come with us we're going to conf comfort you we're going to you're going to be with us it's going to be okay and I how I had this thing that suddenly said no don't go there just reject them you know fuck off get off my back get off my family um, and it was uh, I just wanted to share that with you. Yeah, you see, what they're trying to do is they, they're trying to patch things up and say, like, you know, it's like the T-Rex. You're confronted with death, and the T-Rex has come into the flock and taken one of the flock out, and you've seen it. And they all say, no, the T-Rex doesn't exist. Don't, like, you know, blink at your eyes and say, la, 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 and say all the spells against the T-Rex. <laughs> so, like, no, the T-Rex exists. Like, grow up uh, is the... And so when you're confronted with death, you 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 uh, it's kind of done with. Your death anxiety is done with, and so you know it puts you in a completely different realm. But it's it's like Dostoevsky. I don't know why I struggle to say his name. Dostoevsky, and um, you know he had a a mock death. Uh, you need to go through something like that. It it gave an epilepsy, right? So, but it. Uh, you know, kind of all the shit. <laughs> There's no shit left in you after that. So everybody's full of shit. Why? Because they haven't had a near death experience. The the so, I mean, uh, you know, you now like Anita Majani or whatever writes these books like near death experience and dying to be me. <laughs> it's like, guys, 
Everybody used to do this. If you're a hunter gatherer, by the time you were you were an adult, you'd been through a near death experience, right? The fact part of our problem is that we're not going through near death experiences. Right? We need to be traumatized. There's not enough trauma. Now the psych professional will tell you the exact opposite. But I'm telling you, if the first near death experience happens to you in adulthood or like in your 30s, you're fucked. A 30-year-old does, does not have the plasticity to incorporate a near-death experience so late in life. So I pity you what's coming if you're, if you're one of these infantilized 40-year-olds like most people are in the country like Britain and America. You're in for deep shit. Well, as a, mean, mother, I, 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 as a mother, I saw that happening with us, our society and the way we bring up young men and women, but mostly men, where they are protected and, and you know, like the psychologists, do not traumatize, do not expose your kids to risk, pad all their toys, put them in playgrounds where they can't hurt themselves. And um, I remember having a, my son is now 30, but when he was young, he was, I was not padding him too much. He had kind of, you know, an outdoor life and because I luckily live close to nature, but I could see him going down that path. And I encourage him to, to not go to college and to go and take uh, take a job on a boat and just go and face the weather getting up at four o'clock to do cargo and ferries and fishing and and he had the most amazing well not maybe not easy years uh, and it's foundation years for his personality i'm not saying he's he's perfect now but at least i wanted him to face hardship risk danger cold pain and i think uh, i think he graduated from that um i think it was worth 10 years of college um the result is that you know he doesn't spend time on video games he doesn't look at his phone i can never reach him on the phone uh you know he just doesn't look at he's not he's not a visual addict of the internet he's just i don't know whatever i gave or i encouraged him him but i think if we can get that across to people who have got young men or young teenagers is to just don't pad them, don't protect them, don't, you know, give them, give them hard experiences, get them in the cold water, get them to have scratches, get them in the mud at an early age, get them to, and girls too. It's not, it's not, but it's just that yeah, men, I, I felt need it so much. Yeah, we evolved for it. It's just, mm. we, we evolved for it. You see, part, part of the thing, um, you know, we have these deficits that are being filled up by things like tech and the, the metaphors and that. So, I, you know, I saw these kind of anarchist types or these, they kind of, I think somebody posted something with this group that was, um, you know, kind of they followers of Uncle Ted. You know, they were talking about their struggle to like do without cell phones and stuff. And they said, like, you can't, you can't, uh, you need to go through some trauma and stuff. It's it's a trauma substitute for you. So it's much deeper than just giving up a cell phone or something like that. So, yeah, I, try, I posted that video on the ship, right? So I thought that was really nice because it was, it was a great thing, you know, the sailing ship. Um, and also a little bit Joshua Slocum, I posted another one, but that thing, that documentary about um, uh, rounding Cape Horn on a sailing ship, I thought really, um, it, it was kind of magic because it just captured on film, um, you know, by the time film was a thing, uh, that, that life was over, but it was just on the borderline, so the guy giving a commentary, it came across, uh, you know, that uh, and what I mean comes across is this feeling of power that you get out of uh, being in, you know, feeling cold and pain and and having risk and stuff. Is is I think somebody posted something say they would last ten minutes and that kind of moment. The thing is, you're you're going to get back to that. Right? You're going back to that. And, and the thing, it's very scary for all these, you know, house rats and you know house slaves and stuff like that, all these closeted, coddled people. Um, that kind of thing is, you know, scary as fuck, just looking at that, uh, the life of those things. But 
the, a couple of things I'd say about it, and that is you, you'd snap into it in a heartbeat. You're a hell of a lot stronger than you think. Um, and it's it's a lot to do with the culture around you. If everybody else is getting on like a house on fire and enjoying it, you, you will too. Um, you, you'll surprise yourself. And um, the other thing is that what I thought came across in that guy's commentary was the feeling of how awesome it was. <laughs> So he's continually saying, you know, like shit that, you know, I think you know, most people think that's awful. <laughs> he's saying like, yeah, and then, you know, but it's just how it was. It was, and it's, um, you can see that he kind of loved it underneath, right? So he's telling you all how, how bad it is, but you can tell in his voice that he kind of loved it. And um, yeah, the vibe was really infectious. I didn't watch yeah. all of it, but I mean, you could, you could, after a couple of minutes, you could really, digging it you know going wow yeah. <laughs> it was exactly. really getting that across really well you know yeah so that, that's what i wanted to try and get across is that everybody's really scared of this but uh it's it's empowering right so everybody has been in the military and stuff now like they they you, you get a feeling of power because they take you beyond your limits it's especially with officer training one of the things is to take you beyond your limits. And there's a simple reason for it is they want to, um, you know, everybody has an idea of their boundaries, but if they take you beyond your boundaries and you're still doing fine, you get to a point where you think, well, I don't know what my limit is. Um, it might be unlimited forever. Because if you, if you go past your, what you think is your limit and you're doing fine, you think, well, you don't know where the next limit is. You never, and, and that's, that's really empowering. That's why those guys have such stiff uh, backs. <laughs> so, um, it makes you feel good. And so, so, but you see, this is what we were evolved for, right? This is normal behavior. We're in a very abnormal period that's about to end. And so it's, it's not something to think, oh, my God, I can't cope with this. <laughs> it's like it's a challenge. But, you know, uh, we evolved for this challenge. So it's, it's like, you know, getting a caged chimp and putting them back in the wild. It's like scary, but um, relax. You you evolve for this challenge. I was thinking of uh, an analogy, which is uh, I've often thought about, you know, about a, a tree uh, weathering a storm and, uh, you know, it can go, it, it can you could state it two different ways. One is that the, uh, the the storm keeps damaging the tree and breaking the branches off it and eventually wears the thing down and dies. Or alternative path is that the the tree is challenged by this and grows stronger and, and more resistant, more able to weather this storm. Um, and I've often wondered about the, the validity of... Um, both of those, but you know, I guess what you're saying is that, yeah, you know, you you the tree gets stronger in the storm; it doesn't get blown over and destroyed. Well, having observed trees where I live, which is constantly a windy place with really, you know, storms very often and everything, you look all the trees. I'll send you some pictures if you like, but all the trees around here are growing in the direction of the wind. They've got this kind of shape that is completely, you know, and there's very seldom trees that fall here because, or branches that fall because they've all adapted to, <laughs> to the wind. <laughs> Although I suppose really it's still a, a little bit unnatural because, the, you know, once they would have been part of a forest and they wouldn't have needed to, uh, to hold up the in the forest. That's a good, the forest that's a good... was destroyed by the British for building their yeah. fleet and for getting rebels out of the out of the forest and killing the wolves so that i read about that something yeah. you you posted about um uh it might have been that tree you've got is it an oak tree or some kind of tree you've got growing a, a seed it's from a, some a famous tree yeah it's a sapling from the uh, an oak that's a thousand year old yeah. um, that's right yeah yeah yeah. Old, yeah you yeah. and they managed you mentioned to, hmm? Yeah, when you when you mentioned it, I ended up reading, and it was describing what happened to all the trees in Ireland, you know, and how so, it was just gradually deforested. Yeah. So, so Sophie, very, gave, very... Uh, Sophie gave that tree a name. Do you want to show what, what the name is? <laughs> what? 
which or the one the one that I because it comes from Brian. Your one. Sorry, your one, Igdrasil. Oh yes, 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 yes. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. It so, only it only sheds um, uh, acorns every ten years, and some enthusiasts uh, took some and they got little trees out of them in the last few years. So some people decided to plant them and I was one of them. So I've got this tree that comes from a thousand year old oak that I'm planting here and hoping that, you know, it grows and it's in a sheltered spot and it's got friends around. And I hope I hope to, that other people are doing this because Ireland has got Ireland has got no forest left. Well, apart from a few places in the north, it's it's uh, it's gone. It's very sad. But that story is brilliant on the big, the big, uh, yeah, Igrisil. We'll yeah. see. We'll see. But anyway, it's a very good observation about the lone tree struggling, and you know, without the forest. And this is this is what the extinction idea is all about. I think is is like building up the forests so, from saplings. But the the it's the thing is, it's not all harsh weather and weathering the storm and stuff like that. There's a huge storm coming, but. But uh, you know, most sailing is plain sailing. You remember all the the freakish uh, storms and dramatic times and cl close shaves. But you know, they they uh, they're the exception. The, the the vast majority is is beautiful. And I don't think that came across in the in the video about the ship. Is is those guys had uh, many times when they were up aloft and um, they described. You know, sailing those sailing ships like a cloud. It was just magic being up there. You know, it's on top of the world. You know, just um, it's just incredible feeling. And that that was the mo the the norm. So a lot of the stuff you know gets reported is dramatic, but 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 anyway, uh, all of this stuff. Uh, so yeah. Um, Okay, so I, I wanted to get through. So, is everybody okay with the manifesto as it is? And can we just have a little vote, uh, show of hands, or something that like is, is everybody okay if it goes out like that? I haven't finished reading it because it's so long, and I'm looking at all the links that you've put at the same time. Oh. So, I, I'm still got some. I've still got some pages to read. It's just, I mean, for us who are trying to to um to be at the meetings on a regular basis and follow up it's just a lot of stuff is known and you've very cleverly put it together i i i'm just in admiration of the work and the time it must have taken you to do all this um so i'm not i'm only half through it um and i uh, really like so, it. so should we so i i'm itching to move on i want to like uh, say goodbye to extinction rebellion <laughs> And move to, uh, you know, and start doing AMAs and stuff like that. And I've read, I've read all the manifesto, and it it was great from my point of view. I read through it, and nothing stuck out as you know wrong or an error. I didn't check any of the links though. I just read the whole thing um, yesterday. So I think it's good. I think it sums up everything. Um, my feelings on it were very positive. And of course, you know, the sense of humor, it's its just great from my point of view. Yeah. Uh, so it, it is, does anybody, so, so do you want to raise lower hands there? Um, or is there there's something to take a vote on this? I'm sure there is. Um, more actions. Uh, I don't know. Do you, do you want to take a formal vote and just see, like, should we adopt this as a manifesto? No, I don't do see. It I, I think it's probably doubtful anyone's got an objection to it. All um, right. So, all right, then let's yeah. say motion is adopted. We'll we'll do it, and then we'll we'll see in the the Western meeting tonight. Tonight, if everybody's okay, but then then I think we should. Is everybody ready to abandon XR Med and <laughs> Extinction Rebellion? Yes, yes please. 
<laughs> yeah, it, it's it's time to uh, make the lifeboat and leave. You know, XR <laughs> make the. Okay, I, I, I'm so looking forward to doing um, goodbye and thanks for all the fish uh, post. Um, yes. I'll point, I'll point to the manifesto just to explain what we are doing, but I, uh, um, I'll put I'll put it on XR Med and then hopefully somebody can like post it on. Our extinction rebellion. I think I'll ask the ratio five to just say here. This is, you know, we're moving out. <laughs> we, uh, we're decamping. So you know, this is what we're all about. And point him to the manifesto and ask him to say, "Do you mind just posting so everybody else can see what we're about?" And maybe he will. And then, and then we might get loads of of, of subscribers on this Exomed sub because you say that. And then we migrate with a thousand members. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the rear guard. <laughs> as as we step off the ship, <laughs> all the rats basically climb on. <laughs> no, I, I, the the numbers are going down if you put them the stuff we're posting. But um, yeah, I'm I'm ready to go to the extinction RG thread. So I'll I'll tell everybody on the thing that we're moving, and I'll I'll put a post to. To Kings North on the, you know, on Exxon Med, uh, and then let's start afresh on the thing. So I'm, I'm thinking in terms of, on the Extinction RD thread, um, I'm kind of bored with all the news and <laughs> all this stuff. So if if I I can't feel I uh, you know we just I would like to do more writing and stuff and not posting, you know, all the disaster porn and stuff from the news um if everybody is is okay with that and won't go cold turkey on the disaster but it's i think we all know what's what's kind of going on and um you know we we need to give it some attention to navigate it but i think the next big thing is a financial crisis and i've said it, what everybody should do and according to my opinion so yeah if you if you if you have news and stuff, then post it on the Extinction RT. But I'm thinking, you know, we, we, we recruit uh, in other ways. I also want to do a video on just explaining um, the flippening, just kind of like that Veritas in one, refer to that Veritas in one and explain the, the flippening so people can, can understand it. But I, I would like to go and find people who would try and challenge challenge us and challenge <laughs> challenge the thinking and um, get more of a debate around it. I think it would do people a lot of good psychologically to get out, out of stirring the doom at her. Maybe it would be good to talk to that Elliot person, but I, I think I might refer people to it in the doom sphere. And, and further and try, and maybe try find you know be provocative and try and find other subs that conspiracy sub there's a conspiracy sub and the anti-conspiracy sub <laughs> and basically try and troll those a bit but it's what it means is that a lot of shitheads are gonna descend on us and I loathe all of that so you know if people will try and support me in answering people but it's this is very very tedious time is when when she, you know basically you've got to do psychotherapy for idiots and i hate it but that's 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 what we're in for it's the price of actually growing um so if everybody's ready for that then are we are we up for it should, should we launch <laughs> for... okay yeah let's that as go well. Yeah, it's like those. Are, yeah, okay. So then, yeah, it's basically have fun trolling people and being provocative and just make them think a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well then, um, aren't, aren't we back again though? Where where we were talking earlier about challenging people, is, which you did write in the manifesto, is not being the way to go that mm -hmm. like you're not really going to change them by doing that um no you can't 
Yeah, no, you know, you're not really going to change admit- it. So, but it, um, it, it's worthwhile warning people. Um, then, yeah, but I, I can't hmm. see you're going to put an enormous amount of energy into just having these fruitless debates and and counterpoints and things with these people who are going to object to it. Um, I don't know. I, just personally, I'm not into that. Well, um, yeah, but what, kind what, of, else, you know, what else to do? So that, well, I don't so know. That, you just it, It's a little bit like I was saying earlier where you, you put it there and, you know, if they resonate with it, then they're the people who, who it, it, it's going to mean something to them. But I think for the people who don't resonate with them, you're, never not, you're not going to turn them around. Oh, oh maybe. Yeah, oh, I didn't make this point on that, on that topic. So, so there are two points to. Uh, so I never in, I never tangle with anybody with the expectation of changing them. I I always do it just for the audience. So it's better. I I always have in mind who's who's reading the thing. I'm just using people as a useful idiot. To surface, you know, the the zeitgeist and and how people think. But. Um, yeah, I'm not on a mission to change anybody's mind. Um, but, you know, you, you have to have, um, a, well, I think you have to have a debate in the public forum um, to get to, you know, to get people, uh, to ferret people out. You, you can't just sit on a shelf um, doing a Darren and polishing <laughs> the manifesto until it bowls everybody over. Yeah, the way I think the way to move forward is is you have to take heads. You know, if if people can see you taking heads, so it's well worthwhile talking to a talking head because if you can take their scalp, um, you you get the audience. See, so that's that's why people won't won't engage. Some at least some people is they're scared you're going to take their scalp, and uh, and so you know, the guy McPherson is is terribly jealous of his audience and stuff, and so. Sam Mitchell and stuff too, and and so they they don't want you to ridicule them or you know humiliate them in front of their audience. But I mean, I think that should be our aim. I mean, and this this is one why it's a good defense. The reason why they won't won't tackle us is is we got nothing to lose, right? So because because we outright cranks, right? We have no audience, and so then they uh, you know they can see we got nothing to lose. And so that it's not worth them losing their, their followers. And so, but for, for us, we, we can take on all comers because we, we're kind of Andy Kaufman. We, we don't care if somebody not punch out. But nobody gets any credit for punching out Andy Kaufman. In fact, you, you get a few negative points. <laughs> so you, in, in our situation, you're kind of in a win-win. It's like if you, if you take a scalp, you get more kudos. And if somebody punches you out, like who who gets any any points for punching out the extinction RT? It's like it's like a joke organization. So I'm I'm wondering whether an idea might be uh, instead of replying individually to people who who post their objections on on the sub, uh, where where. You know, you could potentially put a lot of work into replying to one person, and it's just lost. You know, um, is to just don't reply. It's just collect together the week's uh, the week's objections and address them at, at at a meeting in one of these videos. Just go through and say, you know, last week we had this, this, this were the main things that people were saying back at us, and let's go into that. Uh, and that way it gets out, you know, the effort that you're putting into it gets out to more people rather than just sort of being oh, replied to one, you know. It, because, you know, you, you, you can you can see it where you, at other times on XR Med, uh, maybe in the early days, not so much now because they're, they're mostly gone away, but you, you had some people there who were objecting to what you were saying and, and you know, you wrote yeah. extensively. Um, but it just all went down the drain hole of that one person. And, you know, and very few other people would have bothered reading it or, or you know, it didn't, it didn't really escape. 
Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. You no, know, and, I, and the other thing is too, you know, as I said, just, just from my point of view, replying to people like that, it's just soul destroying. You oh, know, yeah. they, they, oh, they, they're, they're just sucking soul. out your energy. Yeah, yeah, they're fucking death eaters. Yeah, but, yeah. but, but this is the thing, though. Um, a couple of things. One, so somebody just recently accused me of um, not not engaging um, because uh, strategic non-engagement. But um, what I found was uh, a lot of people just do a diss. Uh, they or they're just trying to do a casual diss to just shit on you um, and then move on. So you won't really hear any in depth what, about what they really think until you engage with them. So, so you've got to kind of like exchange the disc, draw them out of it, and then you can you can find out where they're coming from. And you need to do that because that nobody has any thought, original thought on social media, as far as I can tell. They just re regurgitate some shit they heard. So they they just you know basically assembling crap off the internet and into some kind of hodgepodge of a denial of death, and then you know they just ah it doesn't fit with with my, you know, my little montage, and then they give you a disc. But uh, you got to uh, find out where they got all this shit from, and find out where all these talking points come. And you can always find there's some shithead like Jordan Peterson or like uh, Abigail Thorne or something, and they spouted this. Or a lot of it comes from college or some shit. But you, you can always find the the you can or you can usually find the where the, the zeitgeist where these uh, memes and shit come from. And then you can answer those. But you have to do a lot of spade work to get to that point, right? Until you can you can start to hear where these these guys' minds are at. Um, and then then once you understand that the lay of the land, then you can start uh, pecking away at that their, their philosophy. Um, but yeah, I just found you just need a lot of work uh, a, lot, a lot of soul destroying work to just find out um you know what the the zeitgeist is and where they're coming from and without that uh you know you can't just try to blaze ahead and assume everybody's going to fall in line behind you and you'll have a big following and you'll forge ahead and survive the flipping it doesn't work that way it's it's kind of you've got to enter the marketplace of ideas and, and start battling and then you start to realize what you know, what the tactics are and what the players are, and you just got to get in the in the in the melee and start start on the more. I think it's the the only way. And it's it, it basically I think just think of it as our service to humanity. You see what you see. Oh, one of the things that I don't think is apparent is in all, if people see me like uh, you know basically doing. A lot of swashbuckling and cut and thrust in something like XR Med, which is oh, it's so I, I loathe every minute of it. But the but what you don't see is and the there were a number of people that came back afterwards and said what a big change I made personally to them. So a lot of uh, I mean it makes me a little choked up a bit. But a number of people said that I saved their lives. Oh, look. Um, wow. Yeah. That's yeah. Big. I, I mean, I think, I think everyone would probably say the same thing, that, that having encountered you is, is a, a, a major life event. Um, yeah. But, but, I can. but here's the thing. I, I, I started off uh, argumentative and combative and had mm. real duels with people, and then they – it forced them, you know, just in because they were trying to get back at me. It forced them to go and have a look at all of the stuff, and a number of people came back and said, you know, I'm talking like ten, <laughs> came back and said, you know, they absolutely hated me, and then they 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 said thanks because it helped them out a lot. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's like amazing. that's like the master hitting his. His student with a stick, and a student asking mm. him why, you know, and you'll find out. You know, it's mm. a bit like the old the, the old teachers, you know, um, in Zen in Zen uh, Buddhism, who used to do that for no reason. Yeah, I went by. But I remember. I remember. Hard, 
I remember something that you wrote at the beginning on the Sirius Institute when uh, I first encountered you. And there was this phrase that you were saying at the beginning of, of your expose that was, uh, well, you know, this is going to be a big filter because this is going to be pages and pages and pages of things. And not many people are going to be able to read all that. So it's just going to be a big filter. And I felt that a bit about the manifesto. And we might discuss that in the Western meeting this afternoon, because um, I think a lot of people cannot um, cannot read uh, more than two or three pages. It's just uh, I, 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 I feel that there's going to be a, this this barrier um um in the world where we live today and uh, now not our, our group we got kind of used to this and we we like it and we, we i mean I, I personally love reading but i think that that's that's still the big filter and it's a good one it's a good one it's it's filters yeah. attention. okay well this is a big subject but the whole thing is a big filter the the it is the great filter. The flipping is the great filter. So this is the separation of the sheep and the goats, as it says in you know, in the book of Revelation. It, it's this is it. It's like very few people get through this. This is the eye of a needle, and so you you can't but come through this transform. But this is how evolution works, and it's back to the Darwin rule. So I said to you, the process of evolution is is uh, focal points of attraction and repulsion, right? Filter the feedback and filtration. So it's the three Fs and that's how you evolve. So so the focal point of attraction is, you know, the people read the manifesto, hear about the extinction RT, and it's like batshit, crazy shit, cranky, weird shit, but there's something attractive. So it's, it, that's a first separator is it repels some people and attracts others. So that's the first alchemy of evolution that's going on in nature all the time. Then it's feedback. A lot of the, the repetition feedback, uh, that's part, part of the thing that basically the mall inside social media is, is uh, getting feedback and amplification. And then, uh, you know, uh, if you just have amplification, you just wind up where Extinction Rebellion is. You just have a big tent it's going nowhere because it's all at odds with itself. And the cure for that is filtration. So they never did filtration in, in Exxon. And, and that's why they got nowhere because they can easily be controlled. And you know, it's, um, it, it, you, you have to have some kind of discrimination. Um, and the discrimination is simple. It's like, um, does it contribute to the Kantian whole or detract, detract from it? So, the you know it's a cancer is uh, a great amplification but it's not you know it's it's your cells they're just multiplying too fast and they're not contributing to the the Kantian whole so the the part of the cancer doesn't contribute to the the health of the body whereas a healthy organ like your heart or lungs or thing, the, the, the word organized comes from the human body organs and so it means that if you have organization it, it means that you have various parts that are complementary and contribute to the whole and the whole in turn feeds the parts and that's what living organisms are and so that's it's all the way down to you know, the the the, um, the micro machines inside your your body all the, the nano machines I mean, not artificial nano ones, I mean, uh, biological ones. Um, and uh, all, all the way up uh, in the cell, the cell looks like a city like New York. And each one of the parts, the mitochondria, all the messenger RNA, they're all the, you know, all the traffic of maintaining a cell. Already by the time you see a cell, you're seeing the whole world. And then those cells, you know, gang up together and make organs. And then those organs contribute to the the person and the person tr contributes to the society and society then should integrate somewhere in in the ecology and the habitats and so that you know and the, the ultimate the ultimate um whole that we're talking about is the whole earth and so you know what part of the thing is industrial society and in our alien cortex is a kind of a cancer which is serving itself 
at the expense of the whole. So it's, it's literally cancer. And and so, yeah, it's um, uh, anyway, that's the process of of evolution. So it's evolution of the extinctionality and the evolution of everybody inside it and the evolution of uh, society. So, so we obviously, in case you didn't get this, we were against the cancer. <laughs> And the cancer is primarily the alien cortex. It's in people's heads. Um, they they all they they all responding. You know, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with humans. They're all just responding to the shit that's going on in their heads. And now, you know, we've been through where that shit comes from. It's particularly it's in our alien cortex. Everybody's got an alien cortex, but it's that darn Neanderthal Pro Magnum crossbreed that um, is kind of you know, the hope of the Ubermensch, but it's also uh, fatal. If, if we don't move out so. of the transition points of this ill-fitting hybrid of Cro-Magnum Neanderthal, um, but if, if, we, if we can't resolve this issue in our heads, uh, we're done for. But we're probably done for anyway. <laughs> There's probably ecological damage and, and deep into overshoot. So if anybody makes it through this, it's going to be a fucking miracle. But I, I, I don't think you can just say, oh, well, some guys in Africa will survive. I don't think we're there, man. I, I used to think that. I, I mean, coming from Africa, I used to think Africa was absolutely bulletproof because there's so many bullets there, for one thing. But there's so many, you know, niches and habitats, tribes. There's so much diversity in Africa. I thought, like, that Africa is resilient. That conceit was wiped away from from me in 2008. I, I can really see that not a, a hamster is going to survive in Africa. And the reason it, it was wiped away in, in 2008, I, I thought that I, Africa was resilient and and isolated from the, from the, you know, systemically isolated from the rest of the world. It wasn't. The crash on Wall Street within hours got to fruit sellers in Nairobi. So you're talking like Guys in, you know, with a little top all and selling watermelons in, in Nairobi. Um, within hours, the price were affected on Wall Street. That shocked me to the core. It meant that Africa is so coupled uh, to our fate that you cannot expect anybody to survive. The, I mean, think of the Puraha, right? They don't have enough uh, habitat. It's, it's not like, oh, you know, all the... Guys in the cities die off, and then you know all the fucking Sami come out of the woodwork and that. The, the, the Pira are now have generators; they have electric lights. The Sami are are being taught in schools. We we're in this uptown next. It, yeah, it, it might be. I was going to say just, this even. Um, it's uh, this, like the San Bushmen and this other tribe, like the Haas something. I, I can't remember their name. Sorry. They're wearing like tennis shoes and shorts, but they're still doing, you know, the hunting and gathering. So it's like this, this culture has literally touched everything. Like nothing is yeah, untouched. I posted one of the things of those guys and his, his dad is is still, I mean, he's fucking riding a donkey, which is very not son. Um, but, but his son He's going overseas to become an engineer. So yeah, this, that was sad. Is, yeah, so it's like that's how fucking bad it is. And and the guys like Bill Gates and stuff and Elon Musk, there's like they don't want to leave a single one of these bastards behind. They, we, we, we've got no resilience. There's no diversity. There's no diversity of thought. There's no diversity of income. There's no diversity of sustenance. We entirely coupled to this giant future. And this is what it's shown. This is one of the, the messages that people are not getting out of this pandemic is we're far too closely coupled. But that's it's like the threads movie. The thread said, you know, was we're all coupled by these threads. And so and what the movie was about was threads was saying in the Cold War, it seemed like nuclear war was coming. All those threads are gonna break. And they say without those threads, people are pretty well fucked. But those, those threads are so extensive now. This mycelium web of this horrendous global economy uh, is, leaves no one untouched. There's, there's no one now that can survive without, without a buck. You know, earning that fucking dollar, that Yankee dollar that comes from the slave system. It's a slave planet. And so it's, 
you know, if somebody survives, it's all bets are off where they come from, right? I mean, you've got, you can make some broad assumptions. Like if you live in a big urban conurbation like New York, you're fucked. There's no way you're going to survive. <laughs> Even the collapse of global industrial civilization or the flipping you, by getting in your SUV and getting on a freeway and trying to get out. It's like, you are toast, man, toast. But as for, you know, th there aren't people really left up in Rwanda, you know, with Jane Goodall talking to the gorillas and stuff. Uh, and then, you know, everything's a park. If you see animals and stuff, they on somebody's game farm or they on a national park. It's like there's no wilderness left, man. And uh, I blame all those charities and those missionaries that started the works hundreds of years ago. They started to spread this globalism far before the industry appeared. It's this uh, uh, so-called educating the savages and Christianizing them or whatever religion. And then then followed by all the all the web of dependency on goods that started to flow as clothes and stuff but the perverse action of those so-called ngos that are so, so-called charities i mean who are trying to get education toilets health care contraception whatever they're trying and they're very um you know being good i don't know there's a word do good -er, type of attitude and and that i mean i i have seen it on and on with colleagues of mine who went working working as doctors in in those countries to try to bring the good medicine and just the the perversion of of stopping women from breastfeeding and giving them formula for their babies and uh, all under the cover of doing good it was it's it's horrible um it's it's everywhere you are totally right i mean i can't see any part of the world that hasn't got it now they've all well, got it well it's it's our industrial cult and the the cult needs recruits so from from the beginning from 10,000 years ago it's been sending out recruits to basically draw people into the cult and we're getting to the end game there's no one left outside the cult so if you go and look at livingston it, it's perverse because uh, Livingston was a do-gooder. You know, not, not a lot of people know this, but Livingston was an abolitionist. His primary aim was to end slavery. He didn't know that the whole of his culture is a slave system and his culture wouldn't work without it. He was a good Victorian Briton. He didn't, he didn't, didn't ever enter his comprehension that Victorian Britain only exists because of slavery. That, that he thought Victorian Britain was good. But that's how fucked up everybody is. They actually think that good is bad and bad is good. But anyway, Livingston went <clears throat> to Africa and he wanted to find a, a trade route up the Zambezi. He said, well, how does trade, <laughs> finding a trade route up the Zambezi, um, <clears throat> you know, stop slavery? Um, well, he was right. It did uh, stop slavery. He, what what trade does is if he knew and he stated this that his aim was to to find a route if he can find a route into the interior uh for traders then traders will set up trading establishment and markets and one of the things sold in the markets will be christian religion and when enough people have bought christian religion then they'll give up slavery and he was right but he what he didn't understand was christianity was a new and perfected form of slavery and the markets themselves that he brought in there to get rid of the cancer were more more cancer. So, so yeah, just absolutely to your point. But anyway, it leaves us all in the same lifeboat. And that, so if anybody, you know, I, I hope I got this point across in the manifesto in that kind of analogy of the lifeboats is we're in the third lifeboat that I put there. So we're, we're in the cabal lifeboat. Is that there are a bunch of guys, and I know this because of my past history, is they very well aware of where, where we are. Right? If you, you think they're all dumb and not responding to climate change because of some puerile nonsense about how greedy they are and stuff, it's like you've misunderstood. They know better than you the situation we're in. Right? You think they haven't taken plans. I've seen them do it. I've seen them play. 
do the plans. They've been at this for fucking since the 1960s. They are so far ahead of you and all your little, you know, anti-tech revolution, TED style or your XR type, you know, prop up the system or whatever. It's like, they, and this is what they're doing. They know only a very few people make it through the filter and they're planning it so that they do it, right? They, they, they are... They, they are educated as as neoplatonists. They're fundamentally neoplatonists, and they taught. They taught it in places like Harvard and Yale and these Ivy League things. They taught about the noble lie, and the noble lie was Plato. I don't think it was Socrates. I think it was straight out of Plato. And and they're saying you fob off for their own good. You do this paternalistic thing where you fob off the masses and make them think they have democracy and they have control, and then behind the scenes you manipulate all the and pull all the threads and that's the playbook that they're operating from now this is you know, um plato thought it was all good and roses and it all you know it was all made the farm all work nicely and then it was all you know like windsor castle and some kind of nice thing but like when the, we're heading to they didn't understand plato and those guys uh, didn't fully understand um, about overshoots and about a Malthusian catastrophe. But when you get to a Malthusian catastrophe, is what do the farmers do? They cull off all the excess, and they they doing it. They're doing it in so many ways. While everybody thinks that they're in charge, and you get people people like Russell Brandon that are actually contributing to the problem, because what they what they're doing is they're putting out this message. People like Mombo, Mombo and stuff like that. They're putting out this message that. Oh, you know, these people are shocking, terrible, and stuff like that. And hidden within there is the assumption that we can do something about it, that there, there is some right way that we can get to, that this can be reformed and stuff. The, the cabal needs that narrative. They need to, to keep people's hope. They need it to, to disguise their real intent and, and it, to disguise the culling. The culling's been going on for a long time. There are various ways that they're doing it. So you can't tell the sheep this because you're automatic conspiracy theorists. The conspiracies are real. I've seen them from the inside. Well, how so anyway, can you're in that third lifeboat. So, so to make it, you're going to have to be, be freaking scared. I, 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 often, I often wondered how a guy like Russell Brown could still continue to talk about the shit he's talking about, like everything, you know, the pandemic politicians psychopaths everything why would he still have a million or i don't know how many followers and that he could be allowed it would never be censored i mean all the stuff he's talking it has to be facilitated in some way he's playing a role uh it's it's you know it's obvious yeah these guys are being used but i i don't i mean i think russell brand is a very nice guy and i'm sure he's got a very pure heart He's, he's not smart enough to see um, his contribution to the plan. He thinks it's, it's the same as, um, you know, uh, Michael Moore and all of these guys. Uh, Chris Hedges, to a certain extent, is that, that um, certainly Noam Chomsky, is they are actually all conservatives. And, and they, they think that, you know, you can shame the system into, uh, into reform. Um, but, you know, we, we're on Melville's lifeboat. The, the cannibalism has been going on for a while in, in, on the quiet. And so, you know, it's like, you, you know, you're keeping the guys asleep. Uh, so anyway, from our point of view, if anybody is, is like, I don't want those the elites to survive. But the, as things stand, they, they are the ones slated to survive. So if you, uh, but the way the 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 counter to it is um you know two can play at that game you 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 they have their own cabal and secret networks and societies and stuff and so yeah there's nothing to stop uh, the little people doing it too and that's what extension is um Steve, I'm just, I'm just, oh, I'm just going, Barry. no no go on tom it's all right because i'm a bit off topic either Sorry, yeah, there's just a lot of points uh, there. There was, I just wanted to go back just to the um, part about um, when you were talking about Livingstone and in Africa and things. Did you did you see that thing I posted? Um, there's a group um, by it's a, a bunch of guys who are like right wing. I guess they're the 
the dissident right i think they like to they're a, a hodgepodge so they're a mix of different right-wing people it was that one about uh ted um on yeah i saw that ted yeah and uh his uh, yeah yeah i just thought there was some interesting points in their conversation later on in the conversation they were talking about back in you know how people in say you know like medieval times and things because they weren't working all the time although they were like you could argue from our although it's just you know i mean from our modern perspective it's probably we can't put ourselves in their mind because our minds are different now but they were like it's we we always have these films showing oh you know some guy came like on a horseback in the village and set fire to everything, you know, and they killed everyone, you know, and, you know, quashed them under the boot. But uh, that, that's probably a lot of the time just bollocks. I mean, a lot of the time the people, the little people were incredibly happy. And like I was thinking about like at Christmas time, you know, everybody came and they were all together as one under the Lord. Everybody knew their place, but they were happier, you know. And they didn't uh, work that yeah. much. They only worked a small amount of the year, like hardly any, like, I don't know, a lot less than we work these days, you know, probably, I don't know, two thirds of the year where they actually doing hard physical labor, but they were happy and they were under, they were under a feudal Lord, you know, it was feudalism, but was that, was that really yeah, slavery? Uh, yeah. So, so it's subtle. Um, so Klaus Schwab's uh, vision is a feudal vision. So those guys are not actually right. The, 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 they're, they're missing a crucial point. I didn't, I didn't think much of those guys or the, the thinking. It's kind of passe. But the, the, um, they're wrong on that point about that the, the feudal lord rides in and burns people's things like it is in the movie. It's, it's like there's a subtle difference. And it's kind of like what you say, we can't understand those people. Well, I understand them because Africa and <laughs> South Africa that I grew up in was feudal. And so I know what it's like uh, in the mind of a, a serf, right? And so they're missing something absolutely diabolical, is that the, the, the Lord would ride into the village like that on a horseback and be an absolute ogre. Um, and here's the thing. This is the bit they don't know. The villagers would love it and support it. So that's a bit too, too, very hard to get your head around. But I'll give you an example. Is that uh, on a friend of mine when I was a kid, uh, a friend of mine had a farm. And around about Christmas time, the, um, some, uh, some of the, the you know, it's, imagine it's a feudal thing. You have a black village. They run the farm. They're the laborers on the farm and stuff like that. And then you have the plantation house, which they live in. Um, around about Christmas, they had all this, you know, goodies and stuff in the storeroom that they're going to give out to all the laborers. And so we're talking thousands of people. And and somebody broke in. A few few guys broke in and stole all the goodies. Um, uh, and so here's the thing. They, they call in the police. They ride into the village and stuff. And um, uh, all the elders in the village and the people, they gave up. The, the guys that did it and the police put them over the front of a truck and you know caned them half to death um, with the support of the villagers and you see you've got to get your head around what's going on there is is that the the villagers are completely in to their slavery right it's it's part of the bargain they're complicit in it so that that doesn't come across in the movies because guys in Hollywood and in the BBC and that they don't have access to that that bit of knowledge is is they always have what they have wrong in those scenes is that the, the guys ride in and he's the muscle and all the villagers are against them saying like you know I say the, the king is a rogue oh seize that man <laughs> no nobody says that this man is a rogue they say John uh, John Tyler he's a fucking rogue I saw him poaching on the king's land and they hand over the you know the poor sap to to the king and rejoice when he's put in stocks and wood. They they throw the fruit at the guy in the stocks, and that's you know, they never get that because that's a little bit too close to home. That's that's a little bit subversive if you put that in your movie. 
Yeah, I mean, it's exactly. So it, it everybody's bought into it, and they're like, they've got to, we've got to sacrifice someone, you know, to for the greater good, as it were. Or they feel like, yeah, it, you know, they're so wedded to it. And it's yeah. they're, they're being exploited, and knowingly, you see, as, as white feudal lords, we knowingly exploited this uh, because you just do it by experiment. The guys came to Africa, and they weren't going to like you know, share. <laughs> so they, they were just like, how do you actually treat these people so that they comply? And you just do it by experiment, by trial and error. And what eventually you find is that we're primates and we have this fantastic um, sense of um, of debt guilt. So so we have this idea of obligation and debt. And and so they you manipulate that. That's, they're all manipulating that primate brain all the time. And so, you know, people, if, if you don't pay your debt to like Bank of America, people ha have a visceral response to you. It's like even people that know that the banking system is evil, that the Federal Reserve was set up by the banks to just basically suck blood out of people. If they, they will, they will diss you. If, if you are, you know, if, if you tell, a, if you a guy, young guy, and you you tell some some uh, prospective woman that you're trying to date, and you say, "Yeah, yeah, I've got huge debts." <laughs> you see how she treats you, <laughs> and you say, "Like, hey, you know what? I'm not going to pay those debts." Well, the room clears out. They'll, they'll fucking haul you by the ear to the police. Even even anarchists, even anarchists will do it because it's our debt obligation is so big in our in our primate brain. Look at Franz Duval's work and stuff, and you, you see how scary it is. But what's hidden behind the Milgram experiments and things like that is that um, they, they're manipulating that, that sense of obligation and guilt and stuff like that. And you know, uh, Hugh, around it all, huh? Yeah, I just wanted to make two quick suggest suggestions. Uh, that uh, Sophie made a point a little while ago about... Um, uh, people not having the, the, the fortitude to read the entire manifesto, you know, because of the, the length of it and that. Uh, is it worthwhile making a shortened version for, you know, the, the manifesto um, for dummies, I you know? Was, I, well, I was, I was, hoping, I was, I was hoping there would be uh, engaging enough to draw people in. If, if it's mm. not engaging enough to draw people in, then, then I kind of failed. But I, I thought, yeah, I thought you know you're going to lose a lot of people. Say, oh, this is junk, um, straight off. Those people you're never going to get. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah. they, you're well rid of them, right? They're kind of lightweights. Mm -hmm. But you, you really uh, only want the people that go, holy fuck, is this for real? <laughs> you see, we know the other thing. Is, you have to imagine it as somebody coming in clean, right? Yeah, no, that's all right. I, I just said I'd bring that up just to address what Sophie said. The other thing was. Um, uh, the, 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 the people in Slovenia and also Sandy Schellers, uh, is there some way to, to uh, in, uh, maybe get a little hint of the manifesto through them, get a little bit of uh, wider? Look, I, I was thinking of, um, uh, you know, in, in the uh, Slovenian for one of his videos where he opened a, opened a book uh, and it's got a comic book inside, you know, it's a serious book, but when you open it up, he's reading a comic. And, and you know, you could imagine a scene like that where he opens up a book and it's just got a glimpse of the manifesto and then, you know, he doesn't have just to uh, that kind of subtle thing to draw I, people in. Um, I, and I, then with, with Sandy, uh, sorry, go on, go on, go on. Yeah, I'm engaging with them and um, uh, they, they're reading and reviewing it. The deal I've got is that, We'll uh, do an interview uh, based on all of the objections and stuff uh, and, and mm. comments. So, uh, yeah, that's the deal. And, and yeah. as, as to Sa Sandy, I was planning to, when everybody, if everybody approves it, um, and if everybody approves it in the the draft um, in uh, in the meeting, the Western meeting, then I then then I just send an update to Sandy and say this is. This is where we're at. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's I, cool. I also okay. wanted to do the same to Faulty, but I think the one to Faulty is just kind of like 
uh, goodbye and thank uh, all of it. <laughs> no, no, I, that was going to actually say this earlier. Send it to Faulty and ask him if he wouldn't mind doing you a favour and getting it published on uh, XR's. Uh, don't bother about Veneratio Five. Just, just dump him. Don't, don't, tr don't submit it there. Just get faulty to get somebody in XR to post it on that sub so that it, it it's there. Um, yeah. So, because uh, anyone, anyone, he can get anyone to do that. Veneratio Five won't let you put it there, or, or no, any of us. Any, anybody there. could. We don't. We don't need. So he's. Yeah, that's what I mean. Anybody can, in. but. You, if, it's going to be one of Faulty's people because all of us are disqualified from the place. And I don't think there's much uh, no, point no, in no, going to I, No, I, I think that I'll, I'll approach Veneratio 5 and ask him if we can uh, do it. And But uh, otherwise, um, uh, no, I think we should post it on the Facebook thing and in general just, just basically uh, stalk them a bit to make yeah, sure. Yeah, I was thinking of... I was I think you've like just printing off a hard copy or make it into a book or something and actually send it physically. I think it's more powerful if you go and like, I don't know, hand deliver it, go up to XR's head office or something. I don't know, like give it to, send it to Faulty in the post or something. I don't know what his address is, but like, because on the internet, it's so easy to just flick. You're so distracted and just shit flick through stuff. You're not going to like read it, but if it's there, like a physical hard copy, like, you know, print it off really nicely. And uh, like you know, just like yeah, here's a book. Like read yeah, that. Like, yeah. <laughs> like that's more powerful, I think. People are more inclined, like or, or just like print off loads of them and just well, spam them, like deliver them uh, through post. Oh, I can, <laughs> I, I can uh, put it up uh, to Google Books, I think. Yeah, but there's so a problem. There. You're, using, you're using the internet a lot in it. There's a lot of links. So if you want to print that, it will have to reflect that because there's a lot of documents and articles and references that will totally uh, be lost if you... Yeah, you'd have to put footnotes. Yeah, it would be I also, more... I think I picked up you that you were, you were thinking of doing a video about it too, which could be also yeah. very good. Because yeah, not that, the manifesto, but just what the flipping is. Yeah, or about, about the flipping, yeah. yeah. And, but I was, yeah, I, was, I mean... I think, uh, yeah, once we've got it all approved, we should just, once we've agreed that it goes out, then, then I think we should go and try and spam it all over the place and, and just see, you know, go troll people. When it, you know, especially, um, you know, basically uh, do it as a, a false flag thing where you you tr you say hey have a look at these freaking idiots <laughs> and then everybody goes to have a good laugh at us and then one or two people go um hang on are these people serious <laughs> they're like uh, no i don't think they're serious no i think they're serious <laughs> that kind of thing uh yeah Using exposing it in jest, I think is quite a good idea as a false flag. But anyway, we're, yeah, we must. Uh, what I'm hoping is maybe we discuss this on the next weekend. But um, yeah, I'm hoping people will take ownership of like a platform. So you know, we go out and <clears throat> just try and put stuff that uh, we keep uh, ex the extinction Arty on Exxon <coughs> on Reddit as the main hub. And then just kind of like repost and shit post and draw attention on things like Facebook and podcasts and stuff. Like <coughs> just to draw attention to it. But let's talk about that next next weekend. Is it? Did we we covered all the topics? Didn't we cover the most of the agenda? I think we did a pretty good job. Ah, well, you so want to have a look? long one, very long one, but anyway, let's round it off now. Quite right <clears throat> quick. Okay, thanks for staying for so long, everybody. Um, and so let's just pause and first. Two. Okay, I will. I will do a shit post to. Paul, I think I'll be, I'll enjoy it. Yeah, you've got, you, that, that's, that's the point we didn't talk about. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> we'll see you this afternoon. <laughs> Bye.
Bye. I yeah. stopped recording. Bye. Okay. Bye.